welcome everybody to the April 18th, 2024 regular meeting of the City of Santa Barbara Harbor Commission. I'm John Sedman, the chair. This is Adam Stanwick, vice chair. And this is Seth Anderson in line for leadership. So uh, we're going to commence with a roll call, if you can do that, Nico. Yes. Commissioner Ford? Here. Commissioner Nelson? Here. Commissioner Stanwick? Here. Commissioner Anderson? Here. Commissioner Cohen? Here. Chair Stedman? Here. And Commissioner Merritt McCray is absent tonight. Now, Director Wolchar, are there any changes to the agenda? Uh, Chair Stedman, none tonight. Excellent. Any general public comment? No, Chair Stedman. Very well. Vice Chair? Great. Thanks, Chair Stedman. Yeah, the uh, next on the agenda is the work group reports. And I know the budget work group met on April 11th. And we discussed things such as the, uh, the operating budget versus the capital budget. We talked about excess reserves, how there's about $5 million in excess reserves and how that will fund some of the capital projects. We talked about contingency planning, really to keep a desired reserve level to fund a possible deductible in case some kind of large disaster happens. And we discussed uh, parking fees as well, which we hope to discuss kind of further at the special meeting on April 24th. Um, that concludes the budget subcommittee or work group report. Any other work groups like to speak on behalf of a uh, meeting? Yes, please. The strategic planning committee or work group met. We met on uh, April 17th to discuss the next steps in our process. And uh, first, we reviewed and discussed the two documents that Director Wilshire sent to us, the 1996 Harbor Master Plan and the 2019 Local Coastal Program Plan, which sur superseded the former. And we agreed to the following three action items. Number one, we're going to begin to work on a document to share with all of you, the Harbor Commission, that will attempt to correlate relevant sections of the Local Coastal uh, program plan with our aspiration document uh, that we created to reflect the Harbor Commission's interests from the January priority setting meeting. Number two, we will work to present to the whole Harbor Commission a couple potential directions to take with a strategic planning along with a recommendation from our work group. And number three, we'd like to request that the topic, strategic planning, be added as a regular item on the Harbor Commission monthly agenda, whether there's just an update or a report, a discussion, or an actual item to vote on. Also, we're going to move our work group meeting times to the second Wednesday of the month in case there's something specific we'd like to add to the Harbor Commission meeting agenda as a result of our work group meeting. And our next work group meeting is on May 8th. Thanks. Thank you, Commissioner Ford. Any other commissioner like to speak on behalf of a work group? I, I, would, like, oh. I would like to add to uh, Commissioner Ford's comments and just uh, commend you for doing such a great job uh, right out of the gate in terms of your leadership. It's quite apparent, and uh, it's very comfortable working with you uh, in the group. I, I'm sure Commissioner Nelson probably feels the same way. So we're expecting great things out of you. Great. Thank you, Chair Stedman. Move on to the uh, consent calendar. Uh, Mr. Lopez, would you read item number one, approval of the minutes? This is item one, approval of the minutes, recommendation that Harbor Commission waive further reading and approve the minutes from the regular meeting of March 21st, 2024. Do we have a motion to approve? So moved. Second. We have a motion and a second. Mr. Lopez, can you please do a roll call vote? Yes, this is a motion by, <coughs> excuse me, Commissioner Nelson, seconded by Commissioner Ford to approve the consent calendar. Commissioner Anderson. Yes. Commissioner Cohen. Yes. Commissioner Ford. Yes. Commissioner McRae is absent. Commissioner Nelson. Yes. Commissioner Stanwick. Yes. And Chair Stedman. Yay. And that motion passes unanimously with Commissioner McRae absent. All right, very well. Let's move on to new business. Uh, item number two, Nico. 
This is item two, vessel insurance requirements discussion. Recommendation that Harbor Commission receive a presentation from staff outlining current vessel insurance requirements and the benefits, impacts, and possible steps to Im implement. Advise on whether the waterfront should pursue requiring vessel insurance to berth, anchor, or more in the Harbor District. <clears throat> oh, good evening, Chair Stedman and fellow Harbor Commissioners. My name is Nathan Aldridge. I'm the Harbor Operations Manager, and our first topic of this evening will be discussion involving vessel insurance requirements. So a little bit of background. Um, as Vice Chair Stanwick mentioned, I believe in our last meeting, in May of 2022, the Harbor Commission had an initial discussion on vessel insurance. And I'd like to build on that this evening um, and flesh it out a bit with some background and uh, some more detail. So um, as you may know, historically, vessel insurance has not been a requirement to moor vessels in the Harbor District. Um, currently, our policy is to require um, slip permittees to sign a release of liability in addition to indemnifying the city of Santa Barbara. Um, our harbor is uh, one of few in California that uh, still does not require insurance. Um, and uh, big picture wise, there are a few pretty glaring obvious reasons why we would like to examine the, uh, the requirement of that and also some uh, significant concerns as well that I'd like to discuss. So um, first and foremost, reasons for mandating a re insurance requirement is that it does protect the city and also the boat owner. Um, from things that can arise. Um, last meeting, we talked in depth about uh, beach vessels and grounded vessels and storm damage, um, you know, marina fires, uh, you know, personal property damage, um, et cetera. And uh, those costs uh, oftentimes uh, go into um, our operating budget and we're responsible for them at times. And so, um, as I spoke about earlier, uh, the the cost associated with disposing of the several grounded vessels um, ate well into our two-year uh, grant from uh, the Department of Boating and Waterways, and uh, it could be poised to exceed our current funding level. So uh, some possible concerns for having a mandated insurance requirement. Um, failure to get insurance could ultimately lead to uh, slip termination um, if there is noncompliance. Uh, there could be a challenge for uh, a certain number of vessels to obtain insurance in the first place, and older vessels. Um, vessels with a, a feral cement hole, some commercial fishing vessels. We can discuss that as well. Um, and then there, there would be a, an obvious increase in administrative workload uh, to manage the compliance and uh, the program itself. And so working with uh, a fellow harbor master up in um, Santa Cruz, uh, they were generous to share some of their uh, process that they went through several years ago um, when they embarked upon an insurance requirement. Um, and in our, our survey of uh, a series of marinas in Northern California, in Central California, and then in Southern California, um, of those 30, uh, 26 do have a vessel insurance requirement um, listed above here. Um, I won't read out all of them. Um, and then uh, there are four that do not of those that are surveyed. Um, so Port San Luis, um, other than their, their moorings, uh, Morro Bay, and then up in Northern California, Eureka, and then Humboldt. And so for a bit of analysis, um, what would provide maximum coverage to the waterfront and to uh, the vessel owner uh, would be some type of liability insurance um, or protection and indemnity or, or P&I. Um, as I said, it provides maximum coverage to the waterfront. Um, liability claims could include um, you know, property damage, bodily injury, personal injury, wreck removal, and pollution or fuel spills uh, or standard inclusions in a type of policy like this. Um, it varies for the recommended minimum coverage. Um, the industry standard tends to be about $500,000. And uh, for premium costs, they vary depending upon the type of vessel um, and uh, the whole construction. So for sailboats, um, around 1.2% of the, the value of the assessed hull. And for powerboats, a little bit more um, due to the nature of the vessel and ancillary equipment and gear. Um, if we were to be listed, we as the waterfront department, um, as additionally insured, uh, there is no cost for that policy as well. Um, one of the 
the requirements uh, for insurance oftentimes is a survey, a vessel survey. Um, there are a few exceptions, generally for vessels that are over 27 feet um, that are older than about 10 years. Uh, they vary in terms of cost. Uh, I did a, a quick look from some different assessors anywhere on the East Coast from less than $20 a foot up to $35 a foot, depending upon the, the area you're in. Uh, and surveys are used to determine the, the condition and also the quality of the vessel for uh, whatever premium would be a, uh, assigned for that. And so for me, it begs the question of which vessels would be affected if we were to go down this road. Um, uh, we could look at this uh, from all vessels anchored in the Harbor District. So that would include uh, our mooring field, seasonal anchorage, and your anchorage. Um, we could look at vessels that are assigned to slip permits in the harbor. Um, the consideration could be made to require or have an exemption for visiting vessels or transient vessels that come overnight. Um, and depending upon some of the challenges and uh, the vessels that may not be able to either qualify or have a hardship, um, you may want to consider, and we may want to consider uh, some exclusions or exemptions. I spoke about commercial fishing vessels, um, some visiting vessels, um, and Santa Cruz, they have a, a policy where uh, transient vessels are recommended to show insurance. They're not required, and if they do wish to stay for what is their maximum of 14 days, they do need to uh, show insurance. Um, and so to, to flesh out the initial concerns, um, I think as you may assume, having a fully insured vessel like a home or an automobile, um, it's fiscally responsible for this owner and all the parties involved. Um, however, uh, it does uh, provide some considerations for uh, what we would do in Santa Barbara because um, I mentioned here we're, we're not a, a private marina and as a public harbor and waterfront, there are some, certain socioeconomic factors I think are, is important to look at and consider. So. Uh, previously mentioned cement hold vessels, older wooden boats, and some commercial fishing boats are often difficult and costly to insure. Um, a majority of marinas require, as I mentioned, a minimum of $500,000 of liability insurance, as well as being named as additionally insured. Um, liability insurance with some policies uh, can be difficult to purchase alone when uh, divorced from hull insurance. Or if you hold both or holding just whole insurance, it can drive up costs. And there is an administrative burden. So staff time obviously would be required for tracking this. The way that vessel insurance works currently in the field, uh, it's a one year policy, it must be renewed every year. And I would imagine that of the you know, 1140 plus slips and anchored vessels, uh, they would be on different renewal cycles. Everyone wouldn't be lockstep, um, whether it's by month or by by week and year. So uh, there would be a lot of uh, tracking and management of that program to ensure compliance. And so if this were the road we'd like to go down, um, in the event if there were vessels that would not be in compliance or coverage does lapse, um, there are several different possibilities that we could look at to uh, ensure enforcement. So um, certain policies have a grace period. You know, uh, it could be a week or two weeks to, to get into compliance with no penalty. Um, some marinas charge a one-time penalty of several hundred dollars. Um, some have an ongoing daily fee to make it, you know, cost prohibitive to remain out of compliance to try to make people do that. Um, and then ultimately, I mentioned uh, it could possibly lead to the initiation of the slip termination process too if uh, vessels do not comply. And so the waterfront's recommendation is that this evening the Harbor Commission advises on whether the waterfront should pursue requiring vessel insurance to berth, anchor, or more in the Harbor District. And I am happy to take questions. Vice Chair? Yeah, thanks for the presentation, Mr. Aldridge. Um, you know, in, in part of the staff report, I noticed that you included the vessel insurance policy of Santa Cruz, and it looks like that was enacted on in 2019 with um, really the enforcement measures being in place starting 2021 with, so basically they, in, they enacted the policy, gave a two-year grace period, and then started enforcing. You know, I'm, I'm just kind of curious, I mean, how did, I'm sure we've talked to them, but how did they um, feel that 
this policy was enacted and kind of implemented? Did they find it successful or positive? Lots of um, pushback from the community. Just kind of wondering what their thoughts were. Great, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, for Santa Cruz, my understanding was uh, the their process was so in the midst of COVID, how they ended up rolling this out. Um, my understanding is that it was initiated as a result of a, a, a fairly significant marina fire. And that, that enabled and sort of caused everybody to take a big step back um, in looking at how they are unprotected, not only just as a, as a district, but um, uh, as, a, as an entire harbor community there too. So um, their process they laid out, uh, which is described to me initially with the hope of having about an 18 month period uh, to go through the steps of, uh, you know, public noticing, garnering public feedback, coming to their version of their harbor commission, uh, having some initial recommendations, and then having that rollout period that you mentioned that uh, did give uh, about a year for people to come into compliance. And talking with their harbor master, that seemed reasonable. I think he, he thought that that period of time was uh, was sufficient in order to message that to make sure everybody understood the whys and also um, how to come into compliance. And the the effects of that is, is if you're two or three steps ahead of me right now and thinking how this would roll out for us is, you would probably inevitably result in uh, at least a, a number of vessels that would not be in compliance or wouldn't come. And so they had uh, a, an initial bump of boats that left the harbor and went somewhere else. They chose not to comply. Um, or some boats that were turned in through that surrendered or surrendered and abandoned vessel exchange program, so that safe program through the state as well. Um, and like Santa Barbara and other harbors, there are, as you know, thousands of vessels that are sort of nearing the end of their useful life, you know, 30, 40, 50 years here in the state. And um, it's, a, it's an issue that uh, we alone are not dealing with. It's, it's very much live and, um, and, you know, all the ports and harbors that, you know, that I talk to up and down the state. And so, um, you know, to answer your question, I think that that time period, I think, felt right for them. It gave them enough time to make sure they talked to their constituents and of the various stakeholders in their, in their harbor as well. And it did have that sort of built-in year for, for vessels to come into compliance before they, they really came down with their enforcement period. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, also, another question I had was, um, just from a budget standpoint, it seems like, you know, one of the biggest increases in expenditures for this upcoming year is the allocated cost for insurance. Do we know if there's any opportunity for if we did require vessel insurance that the overall insurance requirement for the harbor would decrease or at least plateau to some extent? Yeah. And if that would um, be helpful for the waterfront? Um, Commissioner Stanowick, the insurance market in California is, is crazy right now. Uh, the main driver of our waterfront insurance is property insurance. So mainly Stearns Wharf, our facilities, our coastal facilities. Um, that insurance burden is going up from roughly $400,000 a year to $1.5 million a year over the course of five years. We're in the middle of that right now. Um, the answer is maybe, but it would probably not overshadow the amount that the insurance in industry is increasing. So we may see a small benefit to, to having some of that liability transferred to vessel owners, mm -hmm. but it would be pretty negligible in the grand scheme of things. Okay, great, thank you. Commissioner Nelson. Nathan, I was, it sounded like the most immediate uh, fiscal impact of not having the insurance was the fact that um, with all these atmospheric rivers and storms that uh, boats break away from the mooring and they wash up and we wind up having to bear the cost of their removal and disposal. How often has that ever occurred that one, that we were unable to cover the cost with the state funds that are provided to us to deal with that? I mean, I understand that you don't know if the grant that you presently have is sufficient to consume the number of boats, but just historically speaking, has it been a problem where the waterfront department has had to assume the cost uh, because the state was unable to cover? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Nelson. Um, in my understanding and, and, and being fairly newer to the position in my research and looking back um, on numbers of grounded vessels in the years past and decades past um, and even extending farther back is the, the way that vessels had been managed according to boats that went aground on East Beach was, it had been different in time. So 
Uh, my understanding is the uh, Department of Parks and Recreation uh, was responsible for removing vessels on the beach years and years and years ago. Okay. Um, looking at some of the numbers, um, I, I recall about 20 years ago in a five year span, they had 78 vessels that right. went aground. Um, and that's a, a tremendous number of boats, as you might imagine. Uh, granted, the, the amount of boats that were in the anchorage during that time, they're larger than we have today. Uh, when San Diego closed their marina, it brought a lot of people up here in, in a similar situation as well. Um, I, from what I can see, uh, as you might imagine, it, it does come out of the operating budget, and our department has paid for those. Um, and we've had to allocate funds to do that and, and move funds around and, and, and work some budgetary magic. Um, because the other option that I've seen up in, in Oakland and the estuary is they have no money to do it, and the boat stays on the beach. And another one comes, another one comes, and then you have an issue with an environmental pollution and rotting holes and protected wetlands. And you know, as as stewards of the of the tidelands in this area, you know, that's my that's my worst fear. What I want to make sure is that we create a, a safe yep. area for all the harbor users, and especially on the beaches too. So it's a I think a great responsibility for us to do everything we can, including financially, to make sure that doesn't happen. And hopefully to be as aggressive as possible to, to articulate this and be able to talk and find ways that we can continue to increase our grant funding with the state in the years to come um, with these types of numbers to be able to share with them. And the administrative burden, would that fall on Jeanette? Yes, uh, our, our administrative staff, myself, um, you know, to be able to look at this process uh, the hope is that a lot of this could be automated with some of our marina management software. Um, you know, we're in the process of trying to uh, to get some other software that can help us to uh, tackle some of these things too. And my understanding from the other marinas in the state, you know, everyone has sort of a different program. Um, some work better than others, but just like any type of billing, to be able to get alerted that you know a you know a policy may be uh, lapsed. You know, then there's the follow-up, and then there's the contact and the letters to be sent. And so, yes, uh, it's it's a significant amount. I, I wouldn't say it's impossible to do, but there there is a fair amount of work that must be done in order to uh, to to make sure that the program is effective and worthwhile. And my final uh, question, Mr. Chair, is um, when you looked into various approaches to this, what came to mind was when I rent a car at an airport. <laughs> I can either go bump to bump, bumper to bumper coverage on the car. So the actual, the, the car rental, in this case, the state is renting, the city is renting the slip. Um, could we establish a pool? Could we, you know, have insurance that would be a surcharge that if you don't have it, you could pay for it as part of your uh, slip fees? I mean, the, just that way. Sure. And you could decline it and say, I'll cover it. I've got my own policy or my own liability coverage or what have you for my boat, and I'll take care of it. I don't know. Did, did you look into the, it's just a, yes, that, just that's a thought. A, no, it's a terrific idea. Um, part of what I had, had researched with the difficulty of getting insurance for some of the older commercial vessels is sort of that co-op model. Um, right. Uh, right. The benefit is everybody pitches in, as you know, a little bit, and hope you never need it, but if you do, that pool is there with that community. Um, but the challenge is, is everybody has to play nicely together in the sandbox and agree to, to chip in with that too. And I can see our marina um, uh, and, and you know, vessel owners who have insurance uh, maybe being on board with that. Uh, my challenge is when I think of you know, the anchorage mm -hmm. and vessels as it is now who yeah. don't need to register right. with us, check in with us, as I mentioned, leave contact information and yep. they have a vessel out there that does go aground and, and they effectively walk away from that too. Okay. Commissioner Ford. Uh, thanks, Mike. Uh, first question was answered, but um, to clarify, really the only downside, not only, but the two downsides are the administrative costs and the fact that we might lose some boats. Any other downsides? Yeah, I um, yeah, I think the economic hardship for some some vessel owners. I've I've seen you know, premiums everywhere from hundred and fifty dollars a year and in the low numbers two hundred dollars a year up to several thousand, three, four thousand dollars a year. I don't have a good sense of how many vessels currently in our harbor do have insurance. 
What I do know is anecdotally when uh, I was an officer checking in boats uh, at times at night, and people would come and bring insurance or visiting boaters, oh, you don't, you need our insurance? And, and I would say no, and so that, that happened often. Um, oftentimes when people bring a new boat and slip or they buy a vessel, they're, they're prepared to bring that. So I have an idea that a fair amount of our, our harbor users do have vessel insurance already. It's tough to get an exact number of what that would be. Um, but if we did make a, a policy and, and just for the sake of argument, let's say we snapped our fingers and made it come into effect tomorrow, um, there would be, a, I would say, a significant amount of boats that would have trouble being able to, to meet that demand right away. So um, with respect to Vice Chair Stanowitz's comment about the, the timing of how we roll this out, I think that would be critical um, to be able to think of what is reasonable. And that would also give us an idea to look at how many vessel owners either refuse to and decide, you know, I, I don't want to get insurance for my boat and either I'm going to sell the boat and the slip turns over, you know, and then we have some movement there. Um, or uh, if we have someone who are a group of people that say, you know, I've been to every insurance company, I just can't do it, and I've been turned down by X, Y, Z here, and it's just, I'm doing everything I can, and I love my boat and I take care of it, but it's 40 years old and people don't want to insure the vessel. Uh, I think it's more than reasonable to work with somebody like that, and then that's what Santa Cruz did as well. So I think that needs to be a consideration too. But I think having that process roll out will be, will be instrumental in identifying where those, those pain points are. Got it, thanks. Commissioner Cohen. Thank you. I can tell you did a lot of work on this presentation. Um, I was happy to see um, so many different uh, entities contacted um, in your research. I'm just wondering, I have a couple questions, but one is, um, did you notice a difference in the way that insurance was treated between public harbors and private harbors? Are these all, are these, is, I assume that this is a mix, this list? Um, I'm, I'm curious. That's correct. I can go back to the list and, and just speak to a few of them for you. Um, so uh, the first answer is yes, it is a mix of public and private. And as you might imagine, um, a private marina can do really whatever they like to do in, in terms of either you know, attracting or denying vessels wanting to come in. They can require um, proof of income. They can require uh, a survey. They can require insurance, um, letter of recommendation or vouching for someone who's a marina member. There's all sorts of things that I've seen for them too. And they can have a marina that has all of, you know, 80 foot beautiful yachts and you know, no issues and brand new docks and things like that too. And in some way that sounds great, but um, as a, a, a public harbor that serves the the boating public in the city of Santa Barbara, I sort of mentioned there are different socioeconomic concerns that I want to be sensitive to, and I think we should. Um, and then our, our boating public, uh, it, it's, a, it's a unique and interesting group here in Santa Barbara. We have a mix of a lot of different types, um, from sort of the aforementioned groups to you know people who can't afford to slip, and so they do live on their vessel um, outside of, of, of the harbor and the anchorage too. So uh, of these marinas, the ones that are private, um, I'm just thinking of the Clipper Yacht Harbors up in Sausalito, um, that's one. Uh, some of the Long Beach Harbors. Uh, San Diego, I didn't have a chance to get some of their marinas or harbors in here, but there are uh, dozens of marinas down in San Diego. Uh, a fair amount of them are private too that, um, that have very high slip fees that are you know, three to four to sometimes even five times what, what we see in Santa Barbara too. Um, and that gives them another sort of discussion point for what type of boats they would like to allow in. And so uh, I think to be responsible for us as a public marina and a, as the waterfront, um, being able to sort of look at the, the combination of what has worked for a lot of these different harbors, especially the public ones, um, and use our recommendations and our best practices from there probably is, is the best course. Um, so on the, on the harbors, I'm sorry, just to clarify, on, of the harbors that don't have a requirement, are most of those public harbors? Uh, of those four, yes, that is correct. They're, they're all public, okay. Um, I didn't know about the, so I have a couple more questions. Um, I didn't know about the fire in Santa Cruz. I think that normally we're talking about vessel insurance with regards to um, boats coming up onto shore, but I, um, I mean, it's a good point that if there is a fire in the harbor that's caused by a vessel that's, you know, not insured, um, obviously that could be very destructive to everyone. 
Um, do we have any idea what the damage costs were for that um, situation, and was it caused by a vessel that was not insured? I mean, any information that might be pertinent to this conversation would be helpful. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, not to speak out of turn, uh, I, I don't know the the ins and outs of the episode. Just talking to their harbor master, uh, he mentioned that that fire was for him the turning point of which got this conversation going. And so um, I've been up to that harbor before a couple different times. Um, that, and we like to think of you know, being proactive to, to address possible exposures you know, from whether it's liability or whatnot. And you know, uh, the talk for the last several months has been a lot about the grounded vessels, but obviously a marina fire, uh, there are people in this room who've, who've been around and seen that, it, and, or a wharf, you know, that's a different story. But um, it's, uh, it's something that you hope never happens, but you do have to prepare for. Um, currently in our, our SLIP program, I think in my staff report, I, I, I put in there that uh, we have a, a clause in there of assumption of risk by the vessel owner in Title 17. And you know, what it says is the owner of any vessel shall assume all risk of damage or loss of any kind to his or her property while it's in the limits of the Harbor District. And it talks about fire, theft, and things. So um, that protects them and their vessel if one of these incidents happens. But it doesn't necessarily take that next step and you know, protect the harbor or have them be on the hook if their vessel is the one that you know, has an, an electrical issue or um, you know, the fire, you know, heaven forbid, spreads to another vessel or three or four or five. Okay. And then my last question is, um, you know, we obviously seem to be an outlier at this point um, as a harbor that does not have this requirement. And you were saying that boats that come here often are surprised that we don't have um, that insurance requirement. Are we becoming somewhere where these boats that cannot get insurance or do not get insurance or are problem boats for whatever reason, are we seeing an uptick in those types of boats seeking our area to more or to, um, you know, it, it, are, we, are we creating a situation where we're encouraging, um, you know, boats that maybe could be problematic to come here? Yeah, uh, thank you, Commissioner Cohen. Um, th I think the, the quick and easy answer is yes, absolutely. Um, both anecdotally from you know, things I hear uh, from problematic boats coming from up north, or I just had one from uh, Newport Beach and Catalina, uh, a couple of different marine safety officers and harbor masters have, an, have a group email for, uh, for challenging vessels like this and trying to let them know um, if one has either been evicted or kicked out or headed somewhere else and one is coming up here because they hear Santa Barbara is sort of the last place. Um, and that, it bothers me because you know, we do our best as a staff and waterfront to make sure that um, you know, we follow policy um, and 99% of the boat owners and the people who come down to the harbor do that. Um, and this is an area that I think is, is one that's is due for a really hard look uh, to, to prohibit just exactly what you're talking about. Um, and especially with that Anchorage, um, it is a, it's an attractive area for people who, who have been kicked out, whether it's through municipal code violations or been evicted from different marinas. Um, they know they can come drop anchor and they're not on the hook, you know, so to speak, with us for really anything. Um, and being the outlier, my also fear is that more and more of these harbors, you know, getting their ducks in a row to have insurance, um, you know, people talk, you know, the harbor, um, you know, the marina community, the boating community is small in California, and, and you know, the word gets out that Santa Barbara is a place where people can go as sort of a last refuge. So, yeah, I think absolutely that is the case. Thank you. Commissioner Anderson. Uh, thanks again for the presentation, Nathan. That I can tell took, took some time to put together and gave me some information that I hadn't seen before. Um, so I, I've, got, I've got a few a few questions. I guess you know my initial thought is, um, if it's costing us more to clean up after the boats that don't have insurance, um, then we're granted it's costing the average citizen or the person that uses the parking lot or whatever. It's costing them money to clean up after the boats, which seems uh, on the uptick just a, a little unfair. Um, is, is a thought that crossed my mind. And then another one, I'd be curious to hear 
on is the slow, uh, how they have a difference between the port versus the mooring insurance. That's a situation that obviously we have as well. How do they decide to differentiate between the two uh, locations for the boats? Great, yeah, thank you. Uh, I, I assume you're, you're talking about Port San Luis yeah. in the moorings, yeah. So my understanding is um, if you've been up there, they don't have a protected harbor, um, and so it's open ocean. And their mooring program um, la lasts for a certain amount of months during the year, and so if you subscribe to the mooring program, you need to have insurance, is how I've read their policy. Um, if you drop anchor in that harbor district, you're not part of the mooring program, you do not need to provide insurance, is how I understand their policy works. Um, and then another follow-up question would be the amount that it cost us to the harbor, the amount that it cost the harbor to clean up the boats or any uninsured boats versus the staff time it would take to track it. My initial guess would be the staff time is, would be less than the cost it is to cover the uninsured boats. Is that? Yes, thank you. That would be correct. Yeah. Um, and then if you could paint a picture for me, what would be the worst case scenario of our current situation with the uninsured boats? Uh, so, Commissioner, can you, can you rephrase the, the question? Uh, what would be, so our, our current existence where we don't require boats to be insured, mm -hmm. what's kind <clears> of the worst, is the worst case scenario that it catches fire and runs it to the pier and the whole pier burns down? Or what okay. would be, what, what is the largest risk we're running? And taking into account, if we only required boats to have a five hundred thousand uh, dollar limit, how much of that worst case scenario would be covered? Yeah, great, thank you. I understand. Um, you know, playing apocalypse thinking. Um, you know, we we have aging infrastructure, as you know. Um, our you know, some of our marinas are still you know wood and creosote, and if we had a an unattended, you know, fire that happened in an area that was inaccessible that spread. I mean, you know, we, we've talked uh, about, and as you know, thinking of, you know, capital improvement projects and the costing it would take to replace an entire marina, marina two, marina three, marina four, it's in the tens of millions of dollars. Um, I, I've, I've just looked at news reports from other marinas where they have vessels that are involved in that too. So. You know, just projecting out, I don't know, I'm thinking maybe a, a one finger that has 30 plus vessels and larger boats that are all 40 foot long and they're, you know, four to five thousand, five hundred thousand dollars each when they're new, plus the infrastructure and the rebuilding and the permit process. I mean, you're in the, the tens of millions of dollars potentially. I know um, uh, sort of a, a tangent, but uh, Crescent City Harbor, when they uh, were just devastated from the tsunami years and years ago, they had to for all intents and purposes, rebuild their entire harbor, um, upwards of you know 40 to 60 million dollars in costs to do that, and they're much smaller than we are. So, yeah, I think and, and you can sort of extend that. You know, of, uh, is that likely to happen? No, and that's why we have you know fantastic harbor patrol and, and fire boats that are at the ready to to make sure that you know we can stop that if that ever does happen too. But you know, um, worst case scenario, we we go on status quo existing like this, and we're we're reactive, you know, when something like that does happen. We hope, you know, fire doesn't happen and then we deal with boats on the beach. It, it takes hits into our operating budget to the tune of tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of dollars in certain years. If the grant funding does go away, there are, there are murmurings that the SAVE program in, in California through the fiscal year 25-26 may not be funded. I'm, I'm hoping that's not the case, but if that is the case and all of the different municipalities are left to fend for themselves, you know, then that directly comes out of our operating budget. Um, or if people choose to walk away from boats. Um, yeah, so I think for me, it's, it's, it is speculative, you know, and I think we can, we can get by. And I think the intent and the intention behind this is to, to look at best practices that are out there currently and look at what, you know, our similar harbors and our partners up and down the coast are doing and then try to do the best we can to uh, to get ahead of some of these potential um, sort of financial and economic challenges. Thank you. Uh, one more question, Commissioner. Uh, do we have, uh, how many wharf fingers are out there after hours patrolling in the general harbor? Uh, so the wharfinger, the night security. Is that what you're referring yes. to? Yes. Yeah, so thank you. Um, so uh, fully staffed, we have two. We have coverage uh, seven days a week. 
the, the challenge that we have um, is an hourly position and uh, maximum they work um, three hour, or excuse me, three days a week uh, and then four days a week in a two week cycle. Um, it's 11 o'clock at night to four in the morning. Um, and those are really difficult positions to hire from. They tend to have a very high turnover rate. Um, and so in you know, my years of being here, um, when, when times are good, we've had you know, two full-time Warfingers, you know, that stay for months and months and months, you know, but I, uh, I can think off the top of my head at least, you know, six probably or seven we've gone through in the last several years. Uh, and that's in addition to the Harbor Patrol regularly patrolling, you know, the wharf there too. You know, but um, at, you know, what I think about of, as their job and their priority really is, you know, fire watch, you know, vessels, you know, breaking loose. They have a, a radio that monitors the same channel that uh, the waterfront is on, so Harbor Patrol, they can contact, you know, um, if there is a, a situation out there. And we have had situations where they've done just that. Um, I can remember two specific times when we've had a, a Warfinger alert Harbor Patrol to a possible smoldering, you know, deck fire that, if left unattended, you know, could have been a lot worse. Got it. Thank you. Commissioner Nelson? Um, I'm wondering, uh, in your review of issues and touching base with everybody, did you, I know you, you and, and Mike meet uh, every couple of weeks with uh, Chris Foss and the commercial fishermen. Uh, I'm assuming that some of the boats that we're concerned about that will either have a high cost of insurance or won't be able to get insurance are the commercial fishermen. And obviously, uh, last I, I've been reading about the local coastal plan and the importance of a working harbor. Uh, there still is an outstanding issue as to whether or not there could be more commercial slips made available. I'd hate to see us move in a direction without taking into consideration the impact on the commercial fleet. Um, when we were looking at uh, the cost of a slip transfer fee, um, staff was able to do a survey monkey to find out what is the nature of the problem. How big a problem is it in our harbor? How difficult would it be for us to touch base with harbor tenants to find out about their insurance situation? So while I agree that we ought to take a hard look at it and we ought to always seek best practices, part of that is doing as much homework as we possibly can. So if Chris would normally be here, but I'd like to see us find the time to at least touch base with the commercial fleet and look into the possibility of doing a survey monkey to decide, you know, maybe find out how many how, how many uninsured vessels are there in the 1,143 slips that we that we manage. No. So. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Nelson. I think that's a that's a place I think where you hit the nail on the head about one of the the concerns I think of our stakeholders specifically would be the commercial fishermen, who uh, by and large have older vessels um, that they manage quite well. You know, they, they know what they're doing. They, they run a business. Oftentimes they're one of, you know, two or maybe the only person working on that boat, whether they're tending, working on the, the engine repair, all of that too. So that will be a hardship for a lot of those vessels, absolutely. And that's why I thought it was important to mention uh, <clears throat> that earlier in my presentation to look at what possible exemptions that would be uh, attractive to the commission or something that I think we should really look seriously at. Um, and we, we've had this initial discussion with Mr. Voss in the past and uh, I, I heard his concerns too and I think you and I both share the, the desire to not run out of the harbor or, or commercial fishermen, absolutely too. So that is something I think we should take a long, hard look at. Um, I think surveys are fantastic. Uh, but, uh, my, my hope would be that we would uh, get an accurate representation of uh, at least a, um, a, a good amount, a good number of uh, the respondents to um, of the marina. I would, I would hate to have 30 people respond or 40 people respond and of that sample size you know, try to make policy decision based upon what I thought was the perspective of everyone. And, um, but I think public outreach and doing what you just said is exactly the way to go. Very well, are there any further questions? Any public comment? Yes, we do have two hands raised, Chair Stedman. So um, Chris Voss and William Nash. Chris Voss, you are unmuted and can go ahead.
Chris Voss, you are unmuted and can go ahead. Okay, uh, good evening, commissioners. Can you hear me now? Yes. Okay, great, thank you very much. Um, Chair Stedman, commissioners, thanks for this opportunity to speak. Um, thank you, Commissioner Nelson, for considering commercial fishing interests in this discussion because it seems to me that um, the commission needs to weigh the pros and cons of implementing a process and or a policy that could have pretty dramatic impacts on the fishing community, negative impacts. Um, a lot of boats are older. My boat's fully insured, but as commission, as, as Director Wilshire mentioned, the insurance market in California is wacky. It's not, I don't think, um, exclusive to real estate or like the pier, for example, and its policy uh, being uh, increased in cost. I think boat insurance policies could get out of whack as well. So the financial burden associated with implementing this policy may be different in the future than it is now. And um, the impact on um, you know uh, underserved communities and commercial fishermen could be significant um, in relationship to uh, increasing insurance costs that um, could be significant, you know, burdensome to the extreme. So I appreciate this discussion around the nuances associated with this. Um, I would just, again, emphasize the need to proceed with care. Uh, let us um, find out how many fishermen in the fleet uh, this would affect in some fashion so that we, we get a scope and scale of um, the potential issue here. But um, my first uh, thought is that it could be um, significant. So uh, please take that into serious consideration during this discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. Next, we have William Nash. William Nash, you are unmuted uh, and can proceed with your comment. Good evening, Harbor Commission. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Excellent. All right, I've got a couple things I'd like to talk to you guys about. First off, the Nash family has insurance on our vessels and our slips. We believe in having insurance. However, um, as Director Wiltshire mentioned, the insurance market is indeed crazy, and um, that needs to be taken into consideration. Now, with regard to something that Nathan just mentioned, that this is speculative and we can get by as things are, that needs to be uh, given some real attention. And then also the statement about 80 foot yacht sounds great in our marina. You know, I think there's a lot of people that would disagree with that statement. And in fact, don't want an elitist marina. And so um, we need to focus on the fact that this is a working harbor and should be accessible to Santa Barbara locals. Now, another thing here is that we were talking about liability insurance, something we have, you know, and they are $500,000 policies in some cases, but a $500,000 policy of a boat starting a fire and burning down a dock is not going to cover tens of millions of dollars to replace city property. I think the city really ought to be insuring its own property. I think the exemptions are too broad. Uh, you guys got your own, you guys would gut your own rule by making too many exemptions. Um, custom boats, people have custom boats. Some of them are insure, are uninsurable. You might want to look into, uh, you know, personal umbrellas or some other form. All right, the surcharge idea I think is very good and that for uninsurable vessels, custom vessels have a buy-in plan for uh, people um, with regard to uh, insurance. Now also, slip termination, boy, draconian, 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 far too- uh, If you can conclude, uh, Mr. Nash, you're at the two minute what? limit, please. What? I'm sorry, I couldn't hear you. If you can uh, bring your remarks to a conclusion, uh, we'd all appreciate that. You're beyond the two minute limit. Oh, okay, thank you so much. I didn't sure. see a timer. Here. Sure, go I'll, ahead and I'll conclude. I'll put stuff in writing and send it in. Thank you so much. Very well, thank you. There are no further hands raised, Chair Stephen. All right, any other uh, questions from the commission? Commissioner Cohen? Um, are 
are we looking for direction then from us on, on this particular item? Is that is that my understanding? Yeah, Chair Stedman, Commissioner Cohen, um, by no means are we making a decision to implement a plan here. This was one of the Harbor Commission's top priorities at our January priority setting meeting. So we're bringing it to you um, for your recommendation if we could should continue pursuing it as staff. The next steps would be for staff to go look into all the things that would be required for implementing an insurance. We can bring it back several times, but this is just an ask to the Harbor Commission of should we pursue it or not. So on that note, I would say that um, my biggest concern is the one that uh, was my last question that, uh, that was, you know, around becoming a, uh, a place that attracts these types of vessels. Obviously, we want to do everything we can to support our local fishing community, our local slip holders to make sure that we can, you know, work with people and provide, uh, you know, a, a means for them to either get insurance or to look at exemptions or those types of things. But I think what we really don't want to do or what we want to stop doing is encouraging ships that are coming here that um, cannot find another harbor that will, will take them. We don't want to be a, a harbor of derelict, you know, boats. And so um, that would be, you know, for me, the goal of going, you know, on this um, expedition. Um, so I would recommend that we um, do look at implementing an insurance program, but also understanding that we want to do everything we can to support the local community in, in meeting that requirement or looking at exemptions. Very well. Vice Chair? Yes, thanks. Um, it's some comments and thoughts regarding this. Um, first off, I think most California harbors require this. Um, you know, 26 of 30 do. It seems to me like it's pretty status quo and Santa Barbara is not part of that, which is kind of strange. Uh, being at the harbor quite often, I've witnessed several collisions, mostly you know, fender benders, boats hitting dock boxes, damaging waterfront property, hitting pylons in the harbor, boats hitting other boats, you know, 20 knot winds and one person trying to take their sailboat out and side swiping another. Um, boats with outboard engines getting hit. It's pretty common and really, you know, if you have a boat in Santa Barbara Harbor, you shouldn't be worried about an uninsured boat hitting yours and having to deal with it, I think. Um, also, with California requiring the boater competency card now recently, it seems kind of strange that we're not requiring insurance, but they're requiring a competency card to accompany that all boaters have. Um, also, in regards to that, you know, it's it's our kind of, um, uh, what we're looking at is the types of boats that we're gonna kind of focus on here. And I think when we look at the, the anchorage and the mooring versus the slips, it seems difficult to me to be requiring people anchoring and mooring to be susceptible to insurance when they could just go to the Channel Islands and there's no police or people looking at to require insurance for anchoring out of the Channel Islands. and know, in, in open ocean like there. So I think that would be difficult. Um, also, I think if we require insurance, I think it does mitigate the problem of having derelict boats because I know a lot of those boats do come into the harbor quite often, and then they kind of shuttle back and forth and back and forth. And I think if they don't have the option to come in because insurance is required, it might kind of clear some of that up, mostly boats that are not operable, not seaworthy, and I think it would probably be a positive to the harbor if we were able to kind of um, weed out some of those that are um, really not operable to begin with. Um, in regards to the liability, um, I, I was kind of surprised that we were recommending 500 and Santa Cruz is 300. I know Ventura is 300. And just kind of looking at policies, I, I called Boat US, which is a pretty common insur insurance company where I know a lot of uh, boat owners have. It's an affiliate of GEICO, one of the biggest ones. And I was just kind of curious. I said, well, what, is it, what would it take for my policy to go from 300 to 500? And although it wasn't much, it was about a 2% raise, which I thought was pretty, pretty fine. Um, but for some of these boats that are really small, like a 30-foot boat or a 25-foot boat, to cause a half million dollars of damage, it would probably be something substantial. So I think that could maybe be looked at if, um, if 500,000 is uh, what's being re uh, required or looked at right now. 
But uh, overall, I would, I would be in favor of a staff proposal to really kind of outline Santa Cruz. I think this is a great, that we have this kind of as a precedent, just like how we did all this work on cruise ships, and we've kind of set a standard for that. I think it's great that Santa Cruz kind of has done this, and we kind of look at what they've done successfully and try to implement it in Santa Barbara, especially with this um, two-year enforcement window. I think that's probably a, uh, a good time period, especially when we have uh, boats that are difficult to insure. But um, I think just for, for me, I'd be in, I'm in favor of looking at a staff proposal to focus on berth vessels in particular, um, focus on exempting fishermen, because I know back in 2022 when we discussed this, that was a huge point of contention. They're providing a really great business for the harbor, so I think it'd be reasonable to look at exempting commercial fishermen and as well as um, finally to look at a possible payment option. Because I know that's been uh, kind of difficult for some people, boats over um, 40 years old, from what I understand, and above 30 feet, they have difficulty getting insured. Um, I know there's a, probably a handful of those, and I think a, uh, like a possible payment option would be probably a good idea to look into. So those are my thoughts. Thanks. Very well. Commissioner Elson, you didn't have any no, more comments. All right. Uh, any other public comment? Nico? No, Chair Stedman. All right. Yes, Commissioner Cohen. Do we need a motion? Uh, Commissioner Cohen, you don't need a motion. No. But staff would appreciate a, mo a motion and an action. And that okay. Would kind of I would, where we'll I would make a motion that we um, ask staff to look into a policy um, given the guidelines that we provided in our conversation today. Second. Nico? All right, so this is a motion by Commissioner Cohen, seconded by Commissioner Ford, to ask staff to look into a vessel insurance policy given the guidelines that were provided in today's discussion. Thank you. Commissioner Cohen? Yes. Commissioner Ford? Aye. Commissioner McRae is absent. Commissioner Nelson? Aye. Commissioner Stanwick? Yes. Commissioner Anderson? Yes. Chair Stedman? Aye. And that motion passes unanimously with Commissioner McCray absent. All right, very well. On to uh, item number three, the department update. Mm -hmm. uh, thank you, Chair Stedman. Um, members of the public, Mike Wilshire, Waterfront Director, I'll be presenting on this second item. It's, it will be brief. So, my report should be really brief. I just have one item. Just wanted to circle back on the cruise ship item that was discussed at council on April 9th. Uh, next slide. So I know you all know that we've been discussing cruise ships for oh, a couple years now. Uh, at Harbor Commission, at the work group level, at the council level. So on April 9th, we took this item back to council and presented a recap of everything we've done so far. So everything we've discussed in the past 18 months with uh, yourselves and the, the work group. So council heard from staff, heard from the public, uh, weighed in on some proposed recommendations to the cruise ship program. Um, so here on the screen now, I thought this was the easiest way to do it. It's a little long, but here was council's motion that passed five votes to one. So I'll, I'll read out this motion. Um, council directs staff to adopt a cap of 20 ships, continue to maintain the agreement on discharge, establish requirements for reduction in the vessel speed reduction zones, negotiate and establish an advanced water treatment requirement by spring 2025, direct staff to develop with Harbor Commission a package of environmental best practices, including a template for minimal requirements, use of in industry ratings and scorecards, direct staff to work with the Harbor Commission to discuss the use of pilots for ships in the channel, as well as requirements for smaller ships and the use of cleaner fuel, approve all proposed improvements recommended by both waterfront staff and Harbor Commission other than the changes described above. Um, so in short, all of the 20 recommendations that were put forward by staff and, the, and Harbor Commission were approved by council. Um, along with some other uh, caveats that we will most certainly be getting into. Next, next slide. So what I propose to the Harbor Commission for next steps is for staff to meet with the cruise ship work group. Uh, that work group is still alive and running. Um, as it seems there's still th some things to kind of clear up and work out. So staff recommends that we meet and unpack and discuss how we're gonna implement all of these 
uh, improvements put forth by council. So once the once staff and the cruise ship work group have a draft plan, we'll bring it back to the full Harbor Commission. And so once this final plan is reviewed and approved by Harbor Commission, staff will work to implement all of these proposed uh, improvements by the, that came from council. So we're not asking for any action per se right now. This council's direction has been received. So we will be reaching out to the cruise ship work group in the near future to sort of get our heads around this, uh, unpack and talk about what the best way to implement all of these um, program improvements are. So with that, that's all I had on this. Um, I, I know there were at least one or two public comments on it, but the intent was not to really dive back into it, just to kind of provide an update of what happened at council and that we'll be getting back to work on it a little bit in the near future. Back to the commission. Back to you, Chair Stedman. Oh, you mean back to the commission. Very well. Uh, item number four uh, will... Uh, Chair, I think, I believe there was a public comment or two on... Do you, is there on, one comment? There, there is one public comment slip that was received, uh, Nate Irwin. Very well. Good, e good evening. I wasn't trying to skip over you. So. Oh, it's okay. Uh, good evening, Chair Sedman and Commissioners. Um, Nate Irwin here representing the Santa Barbara Channel Keeper. I'm here tonight to thank the Harbor Commission, the Harbor Commission Cruise Ship Working Group, and the Waterfront staff for all of the work that you've done to organize these public meetings, allow for information gathering, public input, um, and just allowing for changes to be made for the city's cruise ship program. Um, Channel Keeper is committed to supporting this work uh, with Waterfront staff and the Harbor Commission as we move por forward towards implementing these important changes. We're excited to uh, work with you and continue to engage in this issue and are grateful for your continued work on this important issue, protecting our coastal community and continuing, continuing our legacy of environmental stewardship here in Santa Barbara. So thank you so much. We really appreciate it. Well done. Are there any others, Nico? There's no more public comment for this item, Chair Stephan. Okay. Now we'll go to item number four. Hello, Chair, uh, Chair Stedman and Commissioners and the public. My name is Brian Dare, Facilities Manager at the Waterfront. Uh, today I'll have a facility report. Uh, we're going to be talking about uh, dredging in the Santa Barbara, uh, in the harbor. Uh, <clears throat> this April of 2024, we did uh, dredging in the Federal Channel. Uh, we did inner harbor dredging, which, which included Marina 1 East Fairway, Marina 1 South Fairway, South Fish Float, West Fairway, Marina 2, Northwest Corner, far Northwest Corner. Uh, this is a simple diagram that shows those locations. Uh, we do a federal dredging in the uh, federal channel twice per year, we call them cycles. This is managed by the US Army Corps of Engineers this is federally funded, about $3 million per year. Federal Channel dredge is twice per year. Uh, the Corps of Engineers has a contract with Pacific Dredge and Construction. Uh, this cycle, uh, we only dredged about 40,000 cubic yards. We normally dredge about 120,000 cubic yards. So um, uh, that tells us we're in good shape. They also uh, tried to do a jill, a, some additional dredging to help us get ready for next uh, uh, winter. The sediment was discharged to the uh, East Beach. Uh, here's a photograph of the Sandpiper dredge, dredging in the Federal Channel. Uh, this is a photo of the discharge on East Beach. Uh, this is an example of the uh, bathymetric survey of the Federal Channel after they do their dredging. So you can see uh, the main channel is, uh, looks very healthy in this diagram. Uh, 
uh, on Inner Harbor dredging. The first area is Marina One East Fairway, which is the area between the far east side of Marina One and the sand spit. Uh, Pacific Dredge uh, was contracted to dredge this area back in spring of 2023. Uh, they uh, dredged about 8,000 cubic yards, but then we lost our window of time by our permit, so they had to shut down uh, for the summer. Then they came back last fall to start that, do that area again, but unfortunately, they're, as soon as they got in with the federal channel last fall, uh, the dredge broke down again. So uh, this was their third attempt to finish that work. So they, after dredging the federal channel, they were free to come over and dredge this area on April 13th. Uh, I have not received a report or an invoice for that dredging, but I'm assuming it's about 8,000 to 10,000 cubic yards. In the spring of 2023, it was also about, it was 8,000 cubic yards, so we doubled that. Again, this sediment was uh, permitted to be uh, pumped and placed off of East Beach. This is a photo of the dredge in that, that fairway. So it's kind of a tight squeeze for them. Out of precaution, we had the support and cooperation of slip permittees to move some of their vessels. <clears throat> the next area that we dredged this month was uh, Marina One South Fairway along the parallel to the breakwater. Uh, Apex Diving and Marine Service uh, has a contract. Uh, they dredged about 13 days in this area. They caught charges about $17 per cubic yard. Uh, they dredged about 3,000 cubic yards. And it was pumped over the breakwater. Uh, the estimated cost of that physical, moving that sediment was about $51,000. There's additional cost in their contract for mobilization and demobilization. This is a picture of the South Fairway along the breakwater that shows the, the small dredge in operation and also demonstrates these, these uh, where the sand infiltrates the breakwater, it creates these sand, sand uh, islands, you might call them. So down where they're working, you can see how they're knocking that back. This is a close-up uh, view of the uh, rig that they use it's on a pontoon boat and then they pump it over the uh, over the breakwater in the water there's a diver with a a suction the uh, you know, managing where to uh, dredge <clears throat> the second area that apex was helping us dredge was on the south side uh, sorry the west side of fish float skiff row they dredged in this area for about four and a half days uh, we estimated that they moved uh, 900 cubic yards at $30 per cubic yard cost. Total cost for this area, just moving materials, 26,000. Uh, additional cost for mobilization and demobilization. Uh, here's a photo with them on the South Fish float. The next area that they're moving to, uh, they'll be uh, mobilizing over to the northwest corner of Marina 2. Uh, they'll move tomorrow and start dredging, hopefully on Monday. Uh, we're ho we are hoping to dredge more, more uh, 2,000 cubic yards or more at a unit cost of $30. And this sediment will also be discharged over the breakwater. Just to give you a visual, I consider this the northwest corner. Um, there was a storm drain there, and over years, uh, that area has built up with sediment. And on King Low Tides, commercial boats and recreation boats have trouble uh, leaving their slip or coming into their slip. We're proposing other dredging in the, uh, what we call the Inner Harbor, uh, is which here is marked in red. Uh, we, for last year, we've been trying to get permits to dredge in these areas. The one that red dot just off of Stearns Wharf, we have a permit for that, but the Sandpiper dredge can't get to it uh, without dredging two football fields to get there. So we're going to probably reconsider a different style of dredging in that area. <clears throat> the um, red dots along the north side of the 
marinas three and four, uh, and also by Santa Barbara Landing, we haven't quite figured out how we're going to move that material. The permits will allow us either to put it off of East Beach or near shore, uh, but the permit will tell us that. Then from that, we'll create a scope of work and work with uh, getting bids. <clears throat> uh, also note that uh, we're planning and targeting what to dredge next, but the funding hasn't been hasn't been identified yet. Uh, any questions? Commissioner Nelson? Um, it says um, waterfront staff was actually doing dredging. Do you have a small dredge? Uh, no, sir. Uh, um, uh, last, uh, in the spring of 2023, uh, maintenance staff, we rented uh, the equipment. You rented it. And then we cooperated with uh, Castanola Tug Service, but uh, in one day, and in four days, we only moved 80, 80, uh, 80 cubic yards. So it was it wasn't cost effective for us to continue with that size of equipment, but by bringing in a contractor, we can see how they're doing it, what the cost is, and we can reevaluate if this is something that we want to continue in house or contract out. Uh, and then you say permitting is in progress. Do you have on your staff someone who actually does applies for the permits? Um, we have the help of the city, uh, Bethana. Her name is Bethana. She helps. It. She has a crew. crew myself. And then we also hire uh, environmental consultants to help us as well okay. um, with the uh, water quality and core sampling and lab analysis, writing up the reports that we go to the regulatory agencies with uh, to propose and to state what we're doing and how we're doing it. And I mean, it's a lot of work. And um, mm -hmm. is she assigned to public works or, I mean, where does she, where? Yes, she's in public works yep. and... Uh, uh, they have a. She's part of the sustainability and resiliency department. Uh, yeah, no, uh, Commissioner Nelson. The Public Works has a, a planning, uh, project planning section, and so they kind of handle permitting and that's planning. Great. And so we we utilize them as. No, as no, it's a great. So, that's a great yeah. thing. <laughs> Thank you. They uh, establish good uh, rapport and relationships with regulatory agencies, so they're they're the face of the city. So it helps us. Uh, uh, steer the ship properly. I love all the metaphors. Nathan with uh, gets them off the hook and <laughs> sail the ship properly. Your, your staff is on it tonight, uh, Director. <laughs> are there are there any other questions from the Commission? Any public comment, Nico? There's no public comment for this item. So if I just want to add that um, we've encumbered about $500,000 to do this dredging that I just got done speaking of, and we'll probably spend about $400,000 of it. So dredging is a very expensive endeavor, and uh, but it's something that we're paying attention to and planning for. Thanks a lot, Brian. Good job. I guess we'll move on to item number five. Uh, good evening, Chair Stedman, uh, commissioners, members of the public. My name is Cesar Barrios. I am the Waterfront Department's uh, business manager. And today, as part of, my, part of my business services report, I bring to you a brief review of the upcoming leases that are coming for renewal within the next uh, five uh, years and how that process will look like. Um, so to, to begin, I will provide a background. So the Waterfront Department um, currently manages a total of 61 lease and license agreements, uh, which include uh, 250,000 square feet of leasable space between the harbor and Stearns Wharf. Um, overall, our leases fall into five primary tenant types, which include uh, food service, commercial, office, nonprofit, and other. So in the next five years, and again, this is reference to the presentation I did last, uh, at the last month in regards to leases, where I 
I broadly talked about the five years in, in the, the types of uses. So now I'm providing more detail on this process. So that said, um, so yeah, we're looking at, we're looking at negotiating uh, 20, uh, 33 lease uh, renewals, which basically expiring, um, 25 in the harbor and eight at Stearns Wharf. Uh, we anticipate that the, most of the existing tenants will uh, have interest in renewing their leases, um, as long as they remain in good standing and meet the, their leases obligations. And in big majority, they're, they're all in, in, in good standing. However, at this time, we, we take the opportunity to review and see how they've been um, operating and uh, how they're abiding by the lease. So as part of the lease process, the department will evaluate each business, as I just mentioned, in accordance with the local coastal plan and the city of Santa Barbara's leasing criteria. So here you have uh, uh, a list of upcoming leases per each calendar year. Um, I've included 2024, which is, it, it, it's, it's outside of the, the next five years, of course, but it's, it's one lease we have coming up in, in August that we'll be negotiating. Actually, it's a license with the Sea Urchin Commission, and that's the Cuda Dock license. Um, and then 2025, we have a few, I won't name them all, but we have the Boat Launch Mini Mart, the, the Sailing Club, uh, the McCormick's Office. So they all vary in, 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 in scope of, of process. Uh, an office is, is a fairly simple process to, to go through overall compared to a restaurant that might have a multi-year multi, uh, multi or a few decades type of uh, lease agreement. Then uh, in 2026, uh, we, it'll be a business year just by how these leases were negotiated at the beginning. The, a lot of them fall for renewal in 2026. And again, I won't name them all, but we have some significant ones like West Marine, uh, the, the, the sailing center and nature's own up on the wharf. Then uh, we go back to kind of a standard uh, number of leases on 2027 and 28. And, and then in 2029, we don't have any, any leases to, to negotiate. We do have a few uh, extensions that take place. Normally we, we don't bring those up to the, to the commission because they're they're, they're already being approved by the, um, by the city council. So um, as far as the, the leasing outlook and process, um, it's important to point out that the, the business turnover in the waterfront is very rare. Um, we maintain the lease occupancy rates of 100% for over two decades. Actually, that's 22 years to be more exact. Uh, and in a rare occurrence, the, the waterfront, business, uh, waterfront business may close their doors or simply not meet the requirements of the lease um, by not being in good standing and, and abiding by the, the, the bylaws of that lease. So at that point, when we, we, um, we get to that point, to that position, the, the department conducts a public request for proposal process, also known as an RFP, um, to select a new business entity. And um, so, the RFP process uh, follows the city of Santa Barbara, Santa Barbara's established policies, uh, not just solely of the waterfront, but city at large. We have the airport uh, and, and a few other departments that have properties. Uh, us being one of the one of the most with the larger uh, pool of, of of properties that we manage. So. Um, in these RFPs, we include the description of the lease space, all the details, the submitter requirements, uh, such as the type of use and services uh, uh, to be provided to the public, as well as a description of how the proposal we reviewed, um, all the details the city, that the city would require of the tenant. It's a very transparent process, and uh, uh, fortunately, we don't get to do this too often. Uh, once in a while, we get an office space that comes up for, for um, um, uh, that becomes available. So um, once a, a proposal is received, the first step uh, is for one of the staff to review it. And then we ensure that the basic requirements are met. And then from there, um, depending on the scope of the proposal, and again, if it's just a, a small office space compared to a two decade proposed lease agreement with a restaurant, it may require um, a, a broader scope or more specific um, subject matter experts, in this case will be other city managers or property managers throughout the city. We may invite the property manager of the airport uh, or, or um, parks and recreations as an example. 
that the, the bring that type of experience to help us determine uh, how to do this. Um, so the RFP then is reviewed by the Harbor Commission. Once we make a determination or have a, a pool of, of candidates, um, bring it to the commission, or if necessary, we form a, a, a commission subgroup depending on, on that scope of the work. So uh, from there, uh, then once the entity is selected, uh, the Harbor Commission requests staff to begin lease negotiations once that's decided. Then at a future date, it could be uh, uh, at least a, a few months uh, while the, the, the lease is negotiated and goes through legal on both sides of the city and the business entity, uh, we bring it back to the Harbor Commission uh, with a proposed lease agreement like we generally do and you see us often here. And then from there, we take it to the city council for their final um, approval. Uh, if the, the lease is over five years, it does require an ordinance, and that's with any, uh, any type of agreement in the city that uh, goes beyond those five years. Um, that it, normally what it does, it just extends the process. So it needs to go to introduction, then the following week goes to uh, adoption, and then there's a wait period for the public to weigh in on any, any, any comments they may have, depending on the type of business that, that we are uh, signing an agreement with. Uh, then all the pro uh, proposed agreements uh, take effect, and then once we go through that process, uh, again, it comes back to waterfront staff to uh, work closely with the tenants and establish all, their, um, all, the, all, the, all the guidelines specified by the lease. So uh, to conclude, um, you know, it's, it's uh, important to, to point out that the, the waterfront department um, likes to pursue and negotiate all these leases to ensure that we're in compliance with the harbor lease uh, uh, policies as outlined, outlined in the local coastal plan, as well as the Santa Barbara leasing criteria. And that criteria um, involves department policy as well as uh, feedback we may get from our city attorney, which uh, they're a big part of, of the lease negotiation as far as um, uh, conducting the legal review of, of all the terms. Uh, in addition to that, they must comply with the City Council Resolution 93127, which is a set of guidelines established by City Council as far as how to conduct business uh, and, and process leases uh, within the City of Santa Barbara. And overall, the, the process ensures that the harbor remains a working harbor. Um, I mean, again, as I, as, I, as I discussed last at the last month's meeting, that's, uh, that's a very important aspect and that's something that we would like to preserve moving forward. Um, and of course, uh, you know, we want to maintain the harbor well uh, as it is until the future. So with that, I'll be happy to answer any questions you may have. Yes, Commissioner Ford. Uh, just one question uh, to clarify. Do you have a current list of interested parties or you only compile that once you have an opening? Commissioner Ford, uh, we, we keep a, a list. I mean, uh, it, it's... Uh, requests come in, I'll say every, every not, not, not too often. Uh, oftentimes what we get is existing tenants that may wish to expand their business. A lot of them start small with an office and then they like to expand. So uh, a lot of the folks are, are in this list, which is not, at this time is not too long, um, are uh, existing tenants that have smaller areas that they like to acquire either more office space or even um, get a larger space of, of any of the properties that may open up, right? Thanks. Commissioner Nelson? Uh, I, don't want, I, do, I don't want to belabor it, um, but um, during our discussion of your very good and comprehensive analysis of the leasing decisions that the Waterfront Department has made in the past five years, the conversation came up was that that was sort of a a retrospective analysis of what was leased and what was visitors serving and what was coastal depend dependent, what was the primary use, secondary use. And we all agreed with that. But we did, we did acknowledge the fact that it was retrospective mm -hmm. and that the Harbor Commission inside the uh, local coastal plan 
is required to basically take a look to make sure that balance exists. And uh, there was some discussion that we might want to um, examine uh, leases that are, are about to expire, you know, during a year, and that perhaps the um, uh, strategic planning committee should take a look at that. So obviously there's nothing real of any consequence in 20, 2025, um, but I guess consistent with what our discussion was at that meeting, we may bring forward, or I may bring forward, a request that we take a look at it, um, that the uh, strategic planning group takes a look at that, uh, and how we might, we might do that prospectively as opposed to retrospectively. Thank you. Thank you. Caesar. Good. Commissioner, Commissioner Nelson. Uh, go ahead. Thank you for that. Yeah, and then, uh, uh, Commissioner Nelson, um, yeah, we, we can establish uh, uh, with the, um, the wishes of the commission to st start that process either via a, a, um, a lease work group or through the process of the entire commission. Okay, that's great. Great. Commissioner Cohen? Um, Thank you, that was uh, a great presentation. I have a couple quick questions. Um, when you're looking at the leases that are up for renewal, um, so I, I serve on the budget committee and I know that when we look at the budget moving into the near future that there could be um, you know, some, some decreases and that's because of maybe some of the tenants having mm -hmm. issues or whatever it might be. I'm wondering if we consider if they are um, bringing in a certain amount of revenue to the harbor that, you know, so that we're meeting our budget goals when we're renewing leases. And if they're not, do we, you know, question if we want to or if the harbor wants to actually look for a different tenant that's going to do that or, or not? Is that, is that in the equation at all? Commissioner Cohen, that's a very good question. And, and yeah, we look at all the factors. I mean, we look at uh, performing and underperforming tenants. Uh, per their lease, they, they, they are by, they have to pay their basic base rent and, um, and, and their percentage rent, depending on the type of business in case restaurants or retail, they pay a percentage rent as opposed to an office space. So that is something that we do consider, but we have to see additional factors to that as well. I mean, if, if, if their lease requires them to pay a to pay a base rent, that's our legal um, agreement with the with the business entity. So in this case, uh, if they're underperforming overall, there might be another factor to it. Maybe not uh, providing the best customer service, not not uh, keeping up with the needs of the harbor through a uh, let's say a five year period, which is a standard lease. Uh, that would be taken into consideration. Um, alone, just the, the financials, if they're paying their base rent, uh, they are meeting the terms of the lease. Okay, so we wouldn't at that point, if like they weren't, if they weren't bringing, if, if they were, we wouldn't at, at any time look at other options. I don't know. Uh, we don't currently have like performance clauses in our lease so that when a lease renews that could be something that the Harbor Commission could discuss or weigh in on. Um, the other thing to take into account is we're not just a profit driven entity so a lot no. of our leases are obviously they provide services they're nonprofits and this so we're, we're probably talking about just the mm -hmm. kind of restaurant tenants, typical business tenants right now, as opposed to the other tenants. But when those leases, leases renew, that's the time for the Harbor Commission to weigh in. Our standard test is a tenant in good standing. So if they're meeting all the terms of their lease, we deem, the, deem them a tenant in good standing, but there's not currently like financial performance clauses. My concern just comes from sitting on the budget committee and seeing that we're projecting some of those revenues with, you know, commercial tenants, um, restaurants to be going down. And I don't think that the economy is in, it's pretty good right now. So, I mean, I understand that there are some other um, things at play when it comes to construction and that type of thing. But 
we don't want to be in a situation where we are continually renewing leases on businesses that maybe are underperforming and then we have a budget issue that we have to resolve. Um, so that's my only concern is just making sure that 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 you know we're we're budgeting properly. And I just was wondering if we take that into consideration at all. It doesn't sound well, like we yeah, do. Sorry, didn't, sorry. Yeah, sorry. Sorry. Just to correct myself, uh, with our restaurant tenants, we we do essentially have a performance clause. So the majority okay. of those at a trigger point, we charge them percentage rent. Okay. And so anecdotally, I can tell you that every one of our restaurant tenants would argue that our percentage rents are too high. Okay. And so when the, the majority of our well-performing restaurants are in that percentage rent, so we're really tied to how they're doing economically, not necessarily some flat rate that we determine. And so the base rent for the majority of restaurant tenants is not even a factor. It's really just what that percentage rent is, be it 10%, 11%, whatever kind of category they're at. And so as the economy gets better and worse, they may do better or worse, but that is tied to gross revenue. And so the, where okay. they're being squeezed is the fact that their profit margins are shrinking, but their overall rent to us is staying the same or growing. I see, I see. And I love all our restaurants. I think they're great. I want to support them. So I just want to add that in. Um, the other thing is when we do get to a situation where there is an RFP, I'm wondering, um, I have two questions regarding that. Um, one is, uh, uh, do they ever bring in an independent body to look at those um, proposals so that there is some sort of, um, you know, oversight that is not, you know, this is a very small town, so um, someone that's independent outside of, of the area to take a look and to give us some feedback. And then also, what is the transparency on that policy when it comes to um, viewing uh, the, the proposals that are, are uh, submitted for, for uh, any vacancies that do come up? And uh, th that's all that I have. Thank you. Commissioner Cohen, thanks for the question. Uh, so from my experience, uh, the, the level of review, as I mentioned in my presentation as well, it, it starts just with staff level, depending on the, on the scope of that, of that RFP. We, then we can expand it to other city staff outside of the department with that uh, knowledge, other property managers perhaps. And then it also could be at the level of the um, uh, Harbor Commission's uh, work group. Um, as far as bringing uh, an external body that we haven't, as far as I'm aware, we, we haven't done that in the last 15 years or so. Um, I can see that happening if, for example, we have a larger property that comes up for our, like, I don't want to name businesses, but we have with larger square footage. If those spaces were to become available, uh, it would be uh, productive for us to have somebody from the outside to, uh, discuss costs per square footage, uh, or any, any type of improvements that we need to do, or, or, or requests of the new tenants coming into this property. Because li likely, if we go into a lease agreement for a larger business, it'll, 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 they'll want many years of that lease. We want to ensure that, one, we are protected uh, financially, and also that we vet somebody that will um, be able to, to make that a successful business. And I'm sorry, my last question was on the transparency related to that process. Yeah, just, just to hop in on that one, all of these go through the Harbor Commission work group, through the Harbor Commission themselves and city council. And so with it, our, it doesn't happen that often in the waterfront because our tenants have been fairly consistent. Our biggest example most recently was Santa Barbara Landing. I believe there were three or four submissions for that RFP. Um, all of those were reviewed by staff, were reviewed by other departmental staff, ranked, graded, brought through the RFP work group, brought through Harbor Commission, and brought through council. And so from a transparency point of view, the complete RFPs themselves were available to all Harbor Commissioners and the public. And, and all of the proposals as well? The, yeah, the RFP, the request for proposals, the proposal packages themselves were, okay. were, were public. All right. Good to know. Thank you. Very well. Commissioner uh, Stanwick. Uh, yes, uh, just a quick question. Um, I noticed all the leases on Stearns Wharf um, really expire kind of November 2026. Is that seven leases with seven different owners, or is that seven leases with one singular owner there? It's, uh, uh, by sure, it's, they're all different owners. Yeah, okay. Yep. Great. Yep. Thanks. Just, mm -hmm. 
Any other questions? Yep. Yes, Commissioner Nelson. Uh, just to, to Commissioner Cohen, there actually was an RFP committee, and it was Merritt McRae and myself, and we reviewed uh, the leases for the proposals for Santa Barbara Landing, and what uh, the business manager, Brian Bossi, at the time did was put together a small uh, review group that was the airport and parks and recreation that took a look at it, and then they made a presentation to Merritt to Merritt and I before we made a decision and a recommendation when it came to the Harbor Commission. Um, but uh, I do want to suggest, though, that 93127 is not an or is is that is the policy that basically says that um, unless it's a, a tenant in bad standing. When, they, when you say renewal, it's basically, that's the end of the lease. That's when the lease terminates. That's when the city, the Harbor Commission, has an opportunity to say, we'd like to move in a different direction or satisfy some public policy. So that is why, at the end of the uh, discussion last time, I thought it might be good for us to start to take a look at how we would do that when these things come up, because otherwise, this thing is a continuing process, and the only uh, input into a new tenant is from the previous tenant if they decide to sell the lease, sell their lease, basically, or their interest in the property. So, and it can't happen. 93-127 is not inviolate. Um, uh, Parks and Recreation Committee. Uh, Park Commission and uh, the Parks and Recreation Department did a new lease at uh, the Cabrillo Pavilion that they advertised on an RFP and they chose not to stay with the existing tenant but to go with a new tenant primarily because they were investing millions of dollars in restoring and renovating that and today there's reunion there is the uh, reunion restaurant there as a result of that process, and they chose to uh, depart from 93-127. So. That's a great example. Uh, thank you. And they hired, they hired a restaurant consultant to give them advice on percentage of gross, escalator clauses, performance agreements, and that sort of thing. Thank you. I have one quick question, uh, Director Wilshire. Can you explain what the trigger point means? Please. Yeah, um, Chair Stebbin, I think you're referring to the base rent versus percentage rent. Yes. And so if you take a, a typical um, restaurant lease, they may, if, they, if their sales are less than, say, arbitrary number, $3 million a year, they will pay base rent. Once their sales exceed $3 million a year, they will move into percentage rent within that lease. And so what that does is essentially that you're, you're not really paying both. And so what you're doing is once you're in percentage rent, that is kind of assumed into your base rent. You don't pay base rent and then percentage. And so those trigger points, what I was referring to, is really just the dollar threshold for that restaurant to move into percentage rent. I see. Mm -hmm. OK, thank you very much. Any public comment, Nico? No, Chair Stepman. All righty. Looks like we're ready for item number six. <laughs> uh, good evening to Chair Stedman and Harbor Commissioners again. My name is Nathan Aldridge, I am the Harbor Operations Manager. And <clears throat> for my staff report, um, I am going to be speaking about Senate Bill 2 and its uh, effects on law enforcement agencies throughout California and in particular our Harbor Patrol. Uh, to give you a little background, um, Senate Bill 2 was established in the end of the year 2021 um, with a rollout of different provisions in the subsequent years and the following years. Um, basically, it's introduced as a bill to address officer misconduct. And um, there are about five major points in this bill. Um, one, it requires law enforcement agencies 
uh, to employ as peace officers only those individuals who hold a current and valid post a basic certificate. And I'm going to get into what that, what that means. Um, it creates a process for post in this agency to revoke um, peace office certifications, such as those individuals will be disqualified um, from employment in California. So if they uh, have been uh, convicted of misconduct, um, they couldn't join another agency somewhere else. Um, it expands the list of circumstances that would disqualify a person from employment um, as a peace officer. Um, and it adds a couple of different reporting requirements. Um, one, requires law enforcement agency to investigate all claims or claims or complaints or claims of serious misconduct of peace officers, regardless um, of whether they're still employed, if they quit or they retire. Um, serious misconduct is defined as dishonesty, uh, uh, abuse of power, um, an unreasonable use of force, uh, you know, a bias against a, a protected group, or a failure to intervene in an unlawful use of force situation. Um, and requires these agencies to report to post all of these complaints or claims and allegations or findings within 10 calendar days. And it re uh, removes some immunity provisions of peace officers um, regarding the Tom Bain Civil Rights Act. So in summary, um, this bill enacts procedures for decertifying peace officers, um, restricts eligibility to hold office as a peace officer, and enacts uh, substantial administrative requirements for, for current law enforcement agencies. Um, and, and part of this provision in section 12, it requires, um, as I spoke, all agencies that can employ peace officers, only those of which you hold a valid post basic certificate. And what that means is uh, attendance at a full police academy, uh, generally uh, over 850 hours or so, um, to, to about eight to five, Monday through Friday, a little over five months or 22 weeks, depending upon the academy. Um, uh, our understanding of the waterfront is there no grandfathering into peace officer status for current officers. And after the academy completion, um, in addition, uh, candidates um, have to go through a full um, FTO program or field training officer program, which is anywhere from 10 to 15 weeks and uh, the subsequent 12 month probationary period to get your post basic certificate. Uh, and so the waterfront department's understanding of Senate Bill 2 is that Harbor Patrol officers will not be able to continue to serve as peace officers unless every current and future officer attends a full police academy um, is given that post basic certificate and our division transitions into a fully certified post participating agency. Um, the Santa Barbara Police Department uh, Chief Kelly Gordon uh, sits on the post commission in California here along with the Attorney General. Um, and at the department um, we initially had been looking at all the different ways in which this does affect us, which may not affect us. Um, there are lots of talk about uh, the different interpretations of what this bill may mean, um, what other departments may be doing in order to comply. Um, needs to say, uh, Chief Gordon uh, is a little expert on this uh, and is heavily involved with post through this entire process. And um, we are operating from, um, from the direction in which we have been given. And so for effects on us at the Harbor Patrol, uh, in a discussion with the city attorney's office, uh, the, the police department in Santa Barbara, um, city administrator's office, uh, human resources, staff, and especially our own officers, it became uh, clear in these meetings that um, these requirements, including transitioning our department into a full post-participating agency and requiring all current Harbor Patrol officers to attend the full police academy is not the most realistic, feasible, or best option moving forward. So what this means is without peace officer status, uh, the Waterfront Department's understanding is that Harbor Patrol uh, would retain the authority to enforce all harbors and navigation laws, as well as Santa Barbara Municipal Code. So that's Title 17 within our Harbor District, but could not enforce California State Penal Code violations. And without peace officer status, Harbor Patrol officers would not be armed 
and all of the other harbor patrol duties and responsibilities would be unaffected by this. So ocean rescue, EMT, um, et cetera. So for law enforcement in the waterfront, our concern is obviously prioritizing the continued and full law enforcement coverage of our harbor district in the waterfront area. Um, additionally, just as importantly, um, officer safety concerns for our harbor patrol officers is absolutely critical um, in determining our level of enforcement and involvement and especially which calls they would respond to. Um, the Santa Barbara Police Department and Chief Gordon um, has met with our group last month um, she's expressed strong support to fill in any gaps in responding to involved law enforcement calls for service in our waterfront area. Um, and what that means is, uh, you know, PC or penal code violations and or calls for service that could lead to a detention, um, an arrest, uh, to ensure that there's no loss of service for our waterfront community. And the harbors and navigation codes, uh, particularly 663.5 and um, 6070.6, uh, continues to authorize our officers to enforce all provisions of boating law enforcement, um, as well as Santa Barbara Municipal Code. And so looking at this um, in a granular level, um, how many calls this would affect and what situations this would be um, in the last two years. Um, once again, penal code violations, calls for service, could lead to a detention, misdemeanor arrest, um, citations. Uh, so several years ago in 2022, um, we had just under 1,800 total law enforcement contacts. And of those, uh, 18 met that above criteria, which is about 1% of our total law enforcement contacts. And last year, um, we had a little over 1,820 and 28 total law enforcement contacts. And of those, 16 met the above criteria, which is about 1%. And uh, as perspective, these are calls that the police department already does respond to. Uh, the change is that they will now be the primary responding unit to the calls. So moving forward, uh, calls for service, once again, involving PC violations or more involved law enforcement calls will be enforced by the Santa Barbara Police Department. And our own Harbor Patrol officer's scope of law enforcement activities and duties uh, will need to be adjusted to consider reasonable officer safety concerns. Um, you know, examples that can come up with, you know, after hours restroom checks for graveyard officers, um, you know, subjects fighting, um, a whole host of things. Um, our officers are going to continue to respond to marine law enforcement violations and muni code violations inside the marinas in the Harbor District, so boating safety um, and infraction level. For us as a waterfront, um, we prioritize the security and enforcement of all of these existing laws, rules, and regulations in our district, especially without interruption or deterioration of service to our harbor community. And it's incredibly important that we assure that Harbor Patrol continues to provide the higher level of service that they're known for. Um, our responsibility as a department is to ensure that specifically our officers are supported in the job they're going to do going forward and given the tools necessary to support that job. Um, as you know, officer safety is, is a critical part of this transition, and as a, an officer who served for years, I'm acutely aware of what this means in the real world, and not sending officers into enforcement or patrol situations that would endanger them in the same way if they did have a firearm is gonna be critical as we move forward. And so I am, um, now happy to take questions from Harbor Commission. I, I have a quick question for Commissioner Ford. Did you do a quick look up on this particular Senate bill at one point and remark that it was stayed? Do you recall that? I did, I read that, but I was told that's wrong. It's in place. Very well. So what would you do, uh, Nathan? Would, would you carry late ta tasers? Yeah, Chair Stebbin, that's a, that's a great question and it gets to the heart of the officer safety issue. So um, part and parcel for this conversation is having uh, some, some real serious talks with our officers about 
this very question. And um, their stated preference was to, to not carry any impact weapons at all and to have some type of uh, visible change in um, sort of their uniform color or appearance. Um, because if uh, they are unarmed but have all the other weapons, um, for example, taser, baton, you know, handcuffs, um, and they would get into a situation or get drawn into a hands-on situation in that force continuum, um, you were limited by, by your taser in that moment too. Um, and I, I understand that point and agree with it. And so uh, their feeling going forward is um, sort of the all or nothing piece. You know, either they're gonna have the, the, the full duty belt with the firearm or um, they would have nothing on, on the duty belt as well. Um, and it would also identify them as, you know, for passersby or people who would contact them possibly on the dock or the beach in a different visual way and they would have a different presence than someone who for all intents and purposes looked like a police officer. Thank you. Commissioner Nelson. 1%, um, you said 1% of the calls that you respond to involve the penal code. So that on one side of that, it makes it sound like it's not a big deal. But to me, I think that the hundreds of calls you made, the fact that you do have armed, that you are a peace officer, is one of the reasons why there's only 1% of the penal code violations. And without that, uh, the stature of a, a patrol officer is diminished. And does the city or the waterfront department intend to try to incrementally uh, have uh, officers go to school and get the peace officer status or get the post certification that it seems that Senate Bill 2 is uh, requiring? And then finally, is there a loss of pay associated with taking the guns off someone's hip? I don't know. I mean, I don't know. So to me, it's a, it's, is, there, is there an impact on pay? Uh, will the department try to deal with this you know, piecemeal and try to you know, incrementally, as money is available, put uh, officers you know, or uh, provide the option to do that? And the whole notion of uh, without, uh, without being a peace officer, does that, in fact, going to increase the number of penal code violations that you have to call the local police for. Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Nelson. Um, all of those questions have, have obviously gone through my mind and we've talked about internally um, numerous times. Um, so to address them you know, one at a time, uh, number one, um, a, an, a critical and essential part of moving forward on this is the, the trust and reliance on our police department. You know, first and foremost, um, and so far there has been you know nothing other than full-throated support from our chief and from the department. Um, you know what that looks like going forward, um, you know, has, is to be seen. Um, but my indication uh, is that their staffing levels are at um, a really good point compared to the last few years. Um, they've communicated uh, support for you know, beefing up their presence and the task force down in the waterfront area as a result of this, um, when it looks for regular patrols in around the marinas, uh, increasing their, um, their presence on our patrol boats and training, um, all those things have been talked about, which I think will be absolutely critical into gaining the trust of the harbor community and, and the waterfront public, absolutely. Um, so that's a, 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 a huge priority, I think, for just the safety piece for, for the harbor community in general. Uh, secondly, um, for your, uh, your second question about the, the academy and sort of the piecemeal approach, that is not the, the approach and direction we're, we're seeking at this time for a host of reasons. Um, and to answer the, the third question about uh, sort of the pay, um, that is uh, uh, not a, a consideration that, that you know, for, for better or worse, that we have a lever of control over at uh, a staff level in the department. Um, it's a labor issue. Um, all the assurances I've had from all the conversation is that we will be status quo moving forward for safety benefits for you know pensions, retirement, salaries, all of that. There's been absolutely no indication from anyone in, in the city and human resources and anything otherwise. Um, and you know this is uncharted waters for us, and it, it's putting our uh, our department, our officers, in a really tough spot mm -hmm. in order to comply with something that. 
um, we, we didn't ask for. Um, and uh, it's, uh, as you can tell, is a significant hardship for us. Uh, one, one question, as a former fire and police commissioner in this city, the manning levels for the police department uh, typically reflect a, usually a significant percentage of them out on disability at any given time, right? So that's a dynamic situation at best. And secondly, if everyone were to become post-certified, then you'd lose the autonomy and control and management of that particular segment of the waterfront department. Is that correct? Yeah, th thank you, Chair Stedman. Um, there are a lot of different proposals that we've imagined what that would be like. Um, one example of that is uh, we don't have any post-certified FTOs, field training officers, so we, someone would have to come externally and uh, fulfill that role to train all of the officers, even if they did go through that, leaving their family and, and children and live away from home for five months to, to go through this academy and then you know, would make it through uninjured, you know, a whole host of things could happen. Um, if they were successful to, in order to come back to, to complete the FTO program, um, so someone from an outside agency would have to come and do that, you know, for each officer and embedded in our department. Um, and uh, that could go a whole host of different ways. Um, you know, I have my ideas, and uh, so that would, that would be a, a concern and an element of that as well, even if we did manage to jump through, you know, all of those hopes with the 10 plus officers who had agreed to do this, you know, um, you know at, at, at the start. So yes, it's a concern. Thanks, Nathan. Commissioner Cohen. Uh, thank you for the presentation. I assume that uh, your department is not the only department in the state that is navigating um, this situation. I assume that this is a conversation that's hap happening um, in, in many, many instances, you know, in many cities um, throughout the state. Um, is what the proposal or the, um, I guess it's not a proposal, is, is the path that you are outlining here for the department pretty much in line with what other departments are doing or um, has there been any uh, conversation with other um, harbor patrols or other uh, you know, entities that are gonna be impacted in the same way to, uh, to make sure that you know, we're not reinventing the wheel? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Cohen. Um, Big picture, uh, having a, a harbor patrol, harbor police, marine safety unit, uh, it looks very different uh, depending upon where you go in the state. So it's a, obviously a unique job. Um, down in uh, as far south as San Diego, they have you know, harbor police or port police that do a lot of you know, port security. Um, they are full academy graduate police officers. Um, uh, moving up to Orange County, uh, their harbor patrol is a, a branch of the sheriff's department. So they work in custody for several years before they're transferred to the boat, so they're sheriffs. Um, some of the smaller departments uh, are operated and run by the fire department, and they have boat operators too, so it's a fire model. Um, some of uh, our immediate neighbors to the south um, have a, a much lighter law enforcement scope from what they do, so they're really ocean rescue. Um, some of the agencies up north that are similar to us uh, who had in the past had not carried firearms do or vice versa. They had uh, carried firearms and did not in the past and uh, don't carry firearms now or have in the past. Um, and some are run by the police department. And so for agencies similar to us, um, it's, it's up in the air. And the discussions that I've had uh, in the direction of how this is going to affect them. Um, I, I think we're all sort of relying and, and, and trusting the information that we're getting from you know, people who are involved with POST, specifically our police chief, um, who similarly to, I guess, the parallel I will make with the vessel insurance is that overwhelmingly, um, the vast majority of uh, all law enforcement agencies are POST participating. Um, we've been uh, very, very good with our training uh, to make sure we model as closely as possible the, the, the full boating and waterways program of training from uh, marine firefighting to the, the basic marine officer course at the LA Port Police, you know, as we would be a post agency with our perishable skills training and, and all of that, you know, holding us to that higher standard, right? Um, and I think uh, some of the agencies are, are taking kind of a wait and see, you know, mode to see what's gonna happen. Um, but the information I've heard is that uh, within, 
you know, the near future, um, those agencies and the way we're operating right now in this real kind of gray area uh, is going to go away. And uh, there's gonna be some change there. And so yes, I think there, a part of that is us needing to, to, to I think, take the guidance and advice from, from legal and also from someone who's involved with the post agency because I'll be the first to admit I'm not, a, um, I'm not an expert on, on, uh, on, you know, on post and, and regulation and compliance. And a lot of this is fairly new. You know, so I think we're, uh, like a lot of other agencies, in the process of figuring this out. Thank you. Commissioner Ford. Vice Chair? Um, yeah, I mean, I just want to take the time to kind of reiterate, reiterate my support for all the Harbor Patrol people out there and um, really everything they do. I know I've been a liveaboard for several years and really all my experience has been very positive with everybody, really from the, uh, the flare demos, the um, night patrol, the uh, fire training, just overall safety at the harbor has been, has been great. And, uh, and really, I was just wondering, how does the Harbor Patrol feel about this going forward? I mean, is it, has it been like a burden for them to carry a firearm and now they're kind of relieved? Or are they, um, are they kind of like upset and disappointed by this? Yeah, thank you, uh, Vice Chair Stanowick. Um, I did, without speaking for all the individual officers, I think uh, the, the first comment I can make is, I think for the vast majority of them, right now it's a very uncomfortable place to be, sort of not knowing and being in this limbo right now. Um, and uh, I think they all would love to have some clarity in, in, in moving forward and having a path forward. And uh, I think knowing what your job is, uh, is a, a huge part of being able to confidently go and do that. And I think people don't do well necessarily with not being sure what's being asked of them. So I. I am acutely aware of the, the sort of lingo, lingo, excuse me, limbo and the uncertainty that this has placed on, on them and their livelihoods too. Um, and I, I know from the vast majority of them also, um, if I had a requirement, if I told them they had to attend this academy and go through the steps I told you, move away from them, live that, um, it, we would lose a lot of officers, the, the vast majority of them. Um, and I think uh, at the outset, I. How we operate right now is, is fantastic. I love our model and the messages that we are receiving and I'm being told is we can't continue to operate in the way that we're doing currently. Um, and that's tough. And that's tough you know, for us at a, a personal level. It's tough for us uh, who you know, put a, a lot of our careers into um, making sure that you know, we can do all of these different jobs and wear these hats really, really well. Um, but I think from them, um, it's really important for us and not only just in the waterfront staff, but the harbor community to, uh, to make sure they do understand that feel that you just said, that you know, they're supported by us, regardless of however we do move forward too. That's, that's utmost importance for, for me, especially with morale, is, is making sure that they, are, they feel supported, they're you know, given the training and the tools to do their job and to do it safely, and then we're not putting them in positions where um, they feel that um, you know, they, they wouldn't enter a situation um, without a firearm that's dangerous. And I. And I can sit here for hours and speculate all of the different hypotheticals and what that would be. And yes, there are many different interactions that start off as benign that could possibly turn into a use of force situation. Um, and we probably all know them and can think of them too. You know? And um, I, I think it's, it's critical to listen to those officers and work with them as we've been doing uh, in terms of defining uh, their responsibilities and what they're comfortable doing. And then also, uh, on the other hand, uh, making sure that just as yourself and liveaboards and people in the community and you know people sitting behind me who, who, who work in you know, Santa Barbara Landing and have businesses still feel safe um, and feel supported you know when they do need help and then for those one percent of those calls you know that lead to something you know most of these that I had um, looked up you know or say you know drunk in public uh, had a, a misdemeanor warrant or arrest and things you know but we do know that there are uh, those situations that are um, uh, much larger than just a, uh, a drunk person stumbling around where you need somebody with a firearm to respond, you know? And, and I am assuming and I am trusting that uh, the support from our police department is going to be their, you know, lockstep with us. Um, and uh, that's how the assumption and how I'm, and we as a staff are gonna operate moving forward. Great, Thanks, I have a quick question. Um, in 2018 or 2019, didn't we evict somebody from the harbor, a liveaboard who was brandishing a weapon, who was drunk and brandishing a weapon? Is that correct? 
I believe so. That is correct. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Ford? So is it completely out of the question to ignore SB2? Yeah, thank you, Commissioner Ford. Um, of course, we could, we could ignore SB2. We, could, um, we were talking the other day, we could ignore ADA requirements when we, we do uh, you know, new construction and new builds. Um, absolutely, you know, could that get us into a whole host of legal trouble and financial trouble and lawsuit issues down the road? Absolutely. Um, so but it, it seems clear to me that there are numerous places that are going to ignore it. No? Yeah, yeah Commissioner Ford, just to hop in uh, with Nathan's saying, we, we have to take the direction of our police chief and our city attorneys. So we, we can't, you know, it's, it's beyond the control of the waterfront department. We can't take the direction of Morro Bay's city attorney or some other entity's city attorney. And so our legal advice is to follow post requirements, just as it is with any other piece of legislation that's pushed down from the state level. So to Nathan's point, we're in a really tough spot. You know, and it's, it's, not, it's not necessarily something that we can go against our city attorney's advice. Mm -hmm. who, uh, Nathan, who is the officer on your staff who is the union representative? Uh, currently, it is Officer Rick Hubbard. Rick Hubbard, okay. Rick, Rick Hubbard. Yeah, that's correct. Okay, thank you. Any public comment, Nico? Yes, we have five speaker slips that were submitted. <clears throat> uh, first is Charles McChesney. Good evening, Commissioner, Good evening. Uh, Commissioners. Uh, my name is Charles McChesney. I'm a slip holder in Marina Two. Uh, about almost 40 years ago, I was a harbor patrol officer. Uh, I went from there to the police department, uh, and in 2010, when I retired from there, I was the uh, hiring and training supervisor for the department, and I was also the post coordinator for the department. <coughs> And I have a lot of experience because of my duties parsing this type of legislation as well as speaking to the people uh, at post and dealing with post regulations and post issues. Uh, to cut to the chase of my presentation, uh, Nathan is very informed about what Senate Bill 2 requires as regards to uh, auditing police officer conduct and reporting to the state. He's been misinformed uh, as to what SB2 requires as to the certification and minimum training requirements to appoint somebody as a Harbor Patrol officer here or anywhere else in the state other than LA Harbor uh, and some of the other harbors he talked about. Uh, and he's also been misinformed as to the requirement of SB2 that the Harbor Patrol become a post agency. Uh, in his bullet point presentation early on, the last five were spot on. The first one was in the in the was where there was an error. There is no requirement for a basic certificate. That's a specific cert certificate that post issues. Um, the section that he cited, what he said is basically what he said is, peace officers uh, have to have a valid basic certificate. I'll read you specifically what that section says today. Uh, Mr. McChesney, you're, you're at the two minute mark, but we'll, we'll extend your time for an additional minute. Okay. An agency that employs peace officers described shall employ as a peace officer only individuals with current valid certification. It doesn't say basic certif certificate. It says valid certification. You drop down to subsection I, a couple paragraph later, it says, as used in this chapter, certification means any and all valid and unexpired certificates, and then it lists basic certificate and a, and a bunch of other certificates that they issue, and then it says, or, or any proof of eligibility issued by the commission pursuant to this section. And that's one of the changes that SB2 created. It created a new certificate called the 
proof of eligibility. When after SB2 was, was passed, uh, Eric, or Eric Erickson, uh, his predecessor, Eric, my good friend Eric, <laughs> he went through and the, that process of obtaining that proof of eligibility certification for uh, officers, and I think, and I'm assuming it's been maintained ever since. That's all that's been required. As to the training requirement, that is set forth in 832 PC, and the, the training requirement under 832 PC is a 64-hour course. Police officers, sheriff's deputies, higher classifications of peace officers are required to go through the basic academy. That's a 664-hour course. Thank, thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Thank you very much. We'd like to hear from you again. Next, we have Eric Engebritsen. Good evening, Chair Stedman, Harbor Commissioners. Uh, Eric Ingebretson here, uh, enjoying retirement these days. <laughs> uh, former Harbor Operations Manager, Harbor Patrol Supervisor, and Harbor Patrol Officer for 33 years of service. Um, I'm just here today to voice my concerns on this SB2 thing. Uh, the effects uh, that are outlined um, in the staff report and um, these broad reaching bills and laws um, really do have these unintended consequences. And um, one of the worst I can imagine is not having a uniformed officer in the harbor 24 hours a day. Uh, I, just, I just don't like to think about what happens after hours in the marinas waiting for a peace officer to come down and take care of a trespasser and something as easy as trespasser. Um, Nathan did a great job on his report. Um, Mike, we've probably had sleepless nights over SV2. Um, it's been a tough go. It's a disservice to the community. Um, it's a huge safety issue for our Harbor Patrol officers. And quite frankly, I think it, uh, um, it opens up the, the organization, the city, to some legal concerns down the road. And that's about all I have, and you all look great, and um, stay safe. You, you look very tanned yourself. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Eric. Next we have Ed Stetson. Hi, good evening. Um, I'm Ed Stetson. I was hired as a Harbor Patrol officer in 19, 85. That was 40 years ago. Um, I've been retired for about 10 years. I went out <clears throat> as a sergeant. Uh, 35 years ago, I negotiated public safety retirement for the Harbor Patrol officers. And for those of you that aren't familiar with how public safety retirement is, it's essentially designed where you have to contribute more money that allows you to retire a little bit earlier because as you're older, you're more prone to getting hurt. Um, I negotiated this with uh, Pete Wilson, uh, Monroe Rutherford, the uh, uh, fire chief, as well as uh, Chief Brisa, who was the uh, um, uh, police chief. Anyway, the Harbor Patrol public safety contract is directly linked to the PD contract. That's how they did it back then. So if you take away the peace officer duties of the Harbor Patrol, I think there's gonna be some real issues about their public safety status, and will that continue? Uh, the other point that I'd like to bring up, of course, all, all, that we're all aware of is officer safety. Numerous times we get called to check the welfare. Um, we can go through hypotheticals, but Wendy Cummings and I went to Marina 4 to check on a slip holder. We went on board his boat, blacked out. When we got to the bow, the gun was against his head, and when we turned the corner, it came to us, and we took him down, okay? This was a check the welfare. We had another boat owner who was on the wharf. We checked the welfare on her. There was a gun in her purse. We had a child custody dispute where the boat owner in his boat pulled a gun on Sergeant um, Mike Hatton and myself. Things happen. Things happen. Uh, 
So if you, the Warfinger, we come, we patrol at night when the Warfinger in the middle of the night has an issue, what do they do? They call Harbor Patrol. One other situation, Brophy Brothers. We've, we're constantly getting called up there for drunken public, whatever. I responded on one where some guy was taking glass tabletops and flinging them like a Frisbee across the room. We can call in PD, but it takes time. The Harbor Patrol is gonna be there very quick. But for us to sit back and say, PD will respond, it's gonna be a concern. The last point I'd like to make is I'm, I'm, I'm surprised that there's not any boat owners here, and it appears that nobody's really aware of what's going on in the audience. <laughs> um, so I'm just, you know, it's, it's um, not many people know about this. So anyway, um, thank you for your time. Well, we do have one commercial operator with several vessels. Next we have Mick Cronman. Thank you very much for your comments. You can speak now and later, Mick, if you would like. Hi, my name is Mick Cronman. I'm a former commercial fisherman, former harbor commissioner, and 19 years plus as a harbor operations manager of the seat. Uh, uh, that Nathan holds now in, in such an esteemed manner. So uh, my, so, and also I want to start with this. I, um, I want to thank Director Wilshire who uh, graciously invited me to sit down with him and go over all things SP2. And I can't say that we came away agreeing about everything, but at the same time, I'm very grateful that uh, he invited me and I learned, I knew more about this when I left his office than when I entered. So I'm gonna set aside uh, those notions. I'm also gonna set aside as much as I can of what the former officers have told you and you're probably gonna hear from them again. I have concerns about response time and all those kinds of things, right? I've seen it, I've been around it. In my time at the waterfront, I reviewed 2,100 watch logs representing every shift for the entire time I was employed there. And I can tell you that however you represent an enforcement call, like Ed described, things can happen quickly. I remember Ed was on a call. Well, they heard a noise below the office and these guys were drunk and pulling down the harbor patrol sign, I think that was hanging on a chain. And then they got jumped and it was on. And I think Ed actually was injured in that. And uh, it, it, so it happens fast. If you'll allow me maybe one extra minute, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I'd absolutely. Like to, thank you so much. I'd like to offer some forward thinking and not concentrate so much on what you're, gonna hear, you're hearing tonight in terms of the challenges and problems with this. But I would like to offer a couple of respectful suggestions moving forward. My hope is that the city would do the following. Number one commit publicly to the fact that they do not intend to have a permanent police presence in the harbor during the, what I'd like to think of as a transition period. What I would personally like to see, based on my personal and professional experience around the waterfront, which extends to 50 years totally in various uh, uh, manners, is that we have exactly what we've got now, right, with the possible addition of requirements relative to post. I think Mr. McChesney spoke eloquently about maybe there are some questions here. I've talked to harbor masters who haven't been asked to do the same thing from their attorneys and, uh, and uh, uh, police chiefs. I understand what I'm getting from that is there's some discretion based on the locale and the nature of the community and all of that. Um, but maybe that's gonna change, I don't know. But um, I'd like to see A, uh, a, pub, a public note of, notice that um, the intention of the city is not to ultimately have a permanent police presence in the harbor. That's super important for the harbor because I know that culture, I know those people, and I don't think they'd think of that warmly if it was articulated in any other manner. I'd like to note that it's been 60 years of Harbor Patrol as it's currently configured. Never a single bullet has been discharged at a human being. These are super well-trained, 
super uh, knowledgeable individuals who understand the culture of the waterfront department. And so along those lines, what I'd like to see as this moves forward, if it tends to be moving in the direction that, that Nathan articulated, is work with the police department so they could shadow, right, not just, not just your basic ride along, but they could shadow officers during their shifts because this is a unique community. You could say the east side is unique. You could say the west side is unique. You could say the downtown area is unique. All true. This is super unique. These are, this is with 1,200 boats and liveaboards and yachts and fishermen and all that. So, so it's, a, it, it's about time right now. Okay, one, okay. Uh, one, one last point, and, and that is um, that uh, if that is able to take place and the, and the waterfront is able to get uh, uh, approval for some overhires, I know they got approval for one overhire, and if they could get approvals for a couple more overhires, it's my personal opinion, they'd have to, you could have an algorithm that could work out so you could cycle individuals through the academy at a rate that would be acceptable to everybody. And I apologize, one more final uh, request if I could, Mr. Chair. I know we're loath to have more committees and commissions. We've heard it from city council. You folks have discussed it ad infinitum, right? But I would, um, because we've daylighted this for the first time tonight, people may feel differently, you know, how about, you know, you know why haven't, you know. I would, this is an exigent circumstance right now in terms of getting the word out. I would strongly recommend an imminent formation of a working group, an SB2 working group, that would include the waterfront department, the police department, and then constituents from the harbor, fishermen, liveaboards, yacht club. And I think these things mesh together will help make what I consider a transition period more palatable, more safe, and overall uh, a, a good direction in case this does become the reality. And another good result is by the time we finish that, the police would have a better understanding of, what the, of what the water, how the waterfront works and the waterfront culture works as well. Thank you for your time. Mr. Ted, thanks for coming forth with a solution. Next we have Jamie Diamond. I think Mick hacked my notes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> except I know he doesn't know how to do that. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, good evening, commissioners, staff, uh, members of the public may be listening. I'm Jamie Diamond, CEO and General Manager for Santa Barbara Landing, I'm owner of Stardust Sport Fishing with my husband and our kids. Um, and, uh, and I've been in the harbor since 2002 when I first started working at then Sea Landing as a city college student. Um, I wanna say first and foremost, I support our officers. Many, well I'd say all of them, I know them. Um, many of them are my neighbors where we live, um, our kids know each other, they've grown up together, they are family, um, and so I want them to feel supported first and foremost, no matter what. Um, so this is not to take away from any of that. Um, I, I agree with the core principles of SB2 2021. It's, it's about dealing with bad apples and accountability, um, and, and that's incredibly important. However, this should have been brought to our attention a long time ago. Um, there could have been something along the way, um, some alternate compliance pathway, um, some way to ensure uh, a better transition and, and definitely at least to notify the public that this was happening. And I get that bills change and, and things change as they get analyzed, but I, I still believe that, that we should have been made aware of this a long time ago with updates along the way via a working group um, or something like that. I also wish that Santa Barbara PD had been here tonight standing shoulder to shoulder with you, Mr. Aldridge, um, to show a united front um, and to offer us confidence and continuity of safety and service. Um, as a business owner, uh, I, you know, I rely on Harbor Patrol's quick response times. Um, and sorry, I'm running out of time, but. Um, you get a little extra because Mick hacked your notes. <laughs> Thank you. Um, <laughs> I. I Personally, um, my husband was chased around the parking lot with a crazy guy, by a crazy guy with a knife. And had Harbor Patrol not responded in a timely manner, something really bad could have happened because it was still a while before PD was able to get there. Um, just a few weeks ago, uh, my co-manager, James Tennant, um, 
we left the office late at night, 10 p.m. about, very dark at that area of the parking lot, terrible lighting, and he notices a man pulling a woman out of a car. And he approaches, says, hey, knock it off, leave her go, he lets go, the guy starts walking away. She says, thank you, gets in her car, James gets in his car, the guy starts chasing him. James jumps in his car, pulls away quickly, turns out there was a wildlife officer there who immediately lit the guy up and called it in. Within, I wanna say, five minutes, if that, four minutes, Harbor Patrol was also there. They were doing their nightly rounds in the, in the vessel and they pulled up. Had the wildlife officer not been there and James' 911 call would have happened, they would have been the first responders. It was a drunk off-duty uh, sheriff's officer, I won't say the county, um, and it was a domestic violence issue and that could have gotten very ugly very, very quickly. Um, and so with that, I just want to finish by saying I'm concerned for the safety of our officers and the harbor community at large. Um, our officers will need to be untrained in incident response so they won't put themselves in dangerous situations. And I know I'm now going to have to think twice before acting as a good Samaritan in my own community, knowing that um, Harbor Patrol won't be able to have my back with a quick response. Um, I might have had more confidence had Maybe we, get, um, maybe we can have PD come and explain how they're planning to feather in um, and shadow our, our officers, get to know our community, because as it was stated, we are a special bunch. Um, and there's a lot of intricacies there. So thank you. Thank you, Jamie. Next up, we have James Tennant. And we do have one hand raised online as well. Very well. Thanks, Nico. Evening, commissioners. Uh, first of all, thank you, Nathan, and the Harbor, our Harbor Patrol team. Um, we rely on them, um, I wouldn't say a, oh, on a daily basis, not necessarily emergency calls, but they do keep all of us safe down there. Um, I have a pretty unique um, exposure to Harbor Patrol because for over a decade, I worked the night shift at Santa Barbara Landing when all, or at Sea Landing back then, when all the dive boats would go out. And we would keep the dive shop open until midnight. We still currently do that, however, a little bit less. But we were down there 100 nights a year until midnight on the quiet side of the harbor over by West Beach, which was very rarely quiet. And it got to, there's a huge value in not only me and being able just to call Harbor Patrol on the phone or 911 if I really could, but I could pick up the radio and tell them exactly what was going down. Uh, one night that stands out in particular was um, I had stepped outside for a little bit of air and there was like five, six people in a massive brawl right outside the landing. And instead of having to go in, grab my phone, all this stuff, I was quickly able just to grab the radio and get them to come out. Um, Harbor Patrol, I would say on average when we have real emergency calls, are there within two minutes. And when they're the emergency calls, like the penal codes and all that kind of stuff, PD does come out and it's blatantly obvious that it takes usually five to 10 minutes to show up. Um, I, again, want to kind of echo what Jamie said. We want to support them in whatever decision that, that, that goes with this. But um, I find it um, somewhat worrying, um, especially with what she had explained with uh, having that recent issue with the guy running after me, who was an off-duty police officer. My family are all in law enforcement, and they are all packing at night. And if but, someone's drunk, we never know. So I just want to echo Nelson's sentiment of it being a deterrent more than anything, and the fact that they haven't had to use those firearms ever, in my knowledge, as well. So um, yeah, we got a great group of guys. And whatever we can do to support them, I hope that we can. Thanks, James. And our final speaker uh, online is William Nash. William Nash, you are uh, unmuted and can go ahead. All right. I support Harbor Patrol, and I think that this proposed change is a monumental mistake. It jeopardizes public safety. It jeopardizes the officers. Uh, the entire marina is used to having a police force there. And I think that all the slip holders need to be noticed up properly, not just posting a notice at the dock and all the business owners. 
So I support these guys. I think they should be armed. I, I myself am a victim of a random act of gun violence. I myself got shot through no fault of my own. Happens extremely fast. And uh, I think it's, you know, this is just a, a, this is a monumental mistake, what's, what's happening here. And I think I'll leave it at that. You guys need to consider this very, very carefully. Thank you. Thanks, Mr. Nash. Any other slips, Nico? There are no slips or hands raised, Chair Stephen. Okay. Uh, commissioners, any questions or comments? All right. Let's uh, move on to, uh, first of all, I want to thank all the public comment commenters. So thank you very much for showing up and waiting for two hours to speak, and I appreciate all the experience that you brought forth to the podium. So thank you again. Uh, now it's time for any commissioner communications or commission communications, if, if there are any. Commissioner Nelson. I, it's just such a, I mean, I, I hate to, hate to follow up what was just presented to us with a mundane question like I have. Uh, having read the um, uh, Local Coastal Act and vaguely familiar with Article 17. Um, you, you read all 376 pages? Well, I mean, it's, I, I, I guess I'm trying to get a handle on what is a harbor district. It is the harbor district, I think, it's all the navigable waters and submerged lands uh, that were conveyed to us by the State Lands Commission, uh, and that would be also on East Beach as well as West Beach. And then there's the Harbor Commission Charter, which was amended to allow us to have make decisions on the waterfront. So I'm just trying to get a feel for the definitions of where our authority begins and ends, where the waterfront department's authority begins and ends, and how those definitions de define that. So and it, it doesn't have to answer now. I'm just saying it's just a, a question that I have that I would love to have answered. It, Commissioner Nelson, it's a, it's a good question. I think we all have it in our head what we think the waterfront is. Um, I can get back to you with formal definitions on that. That's, that's Any other uh, commission communications? Staff has one. Staff communications. Thank you, Chair Stedman. Just a reminder, uh, our agendas have been pretty busy, so I wanted to get a note out there. We have uh, Operation Clean Sweep on May 4th. Uh, it's a great event. We always appreciate volunteers. I know some Harbor Commissioners have lended a hand in the past. Um, also, the Harbor Swap Meet on May 18th. Uh, both of those events run from 8 a.m. to noon. So if you need more information or if anybody tuned in needs more information, reach out to myself, the Waterfront, uh, Angela. Any one of us can kind of get you more details on how to participate. So that's just wanted to get that out there because we didn't have a formal item on it. Get, get those Instagram posts up. That was a good one yesterday on hiring. The aerial shot I thought was pretty pretty cool. All right. Any other uh, <laughs> staff communications? Very well. Is there a motion for adjournment? Motion to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor say aye. 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 He loves to do that, doesn't he? Oh, man.